Welcome everyone on this uh, afternoon session. Uh, we are here at the auditorium, uh, one of the auditoria at, uh, at DTU, with uh, only a limited number of persons, count 10. And uh, we are here for uh, the defense of uh, Gilles Dagle-Marek. Welcome. Uh, who is defending his PhD thesis with uh, the title Bycatch of Seabirds in Danish Gillnet Fisheries, Assessing Scale and Testing Mitigation. And uh, the name of the presentation is the same name as the service. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, uh, Gilda's supervisors, uh, Finn Larsen from DTU Aqua, and the co-supervisor, uh, Lotte Kind Larsen, also DTU Aqua, and I would very warmly like to welcome the examiners, and I start with the external ones. Uh, that is uh, Simon Northwich from uh, School of Biology, Sea Mammal Research Unit at the Scottish Oceans Institute in the UK. Uh, Dominic Marshowski from the Museum and Institute of Zoology, Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw, Poland. And the head of the examination committee, senior researcher Ludwig Arm Krau, also from DTU Aqua. Uh, my name is Stefan Neunfeld. I am a senior researcher here at DTU Aqua and I am chairing these afternoon's happenings. So welcome once again and welcome to the auditory too. Um, I would very briefly like to tell you the uh, procedure and uh, we will start with uh, Gilda's presentation which will last around 45 minutes, maybe 50. And uh, then we will have a short break, which could either be a health break or a break for anybody who would like to leave the room and not participate in the discussion itself. After these five minutes, we will uh, then have got uh, the questioning. And uh, in relation to that, I have to inform you that this whole session is scheduled to a maximum of three hours, which means we will close at uh, four o'clock Copenhagen time sharp. Uh, it doesn't have to take four hours. And uh, we have got the uh, examiners, but there is also possibility to have questions exhortatory. But if anybody in the auditorium would like to pose a question, I would have to know this now. I don't see any hands, very good. So uh, we will restrain ourselves to our examiners. And let me see, I don't think I've got anything. So uh, with this, I would like to give the word to Gilda. Gilda, please. Okay, I muted the microphone. Can you all hear me? Yes, fine. So I'll get started. First, thanks, Stefan, for, for being a chair today. Special thanks to the, the assessment committee. Simon, Dominic, and Ludwig for being here for uh, assessing my work. And uh, warm thanks to everybody for being here or on Zoom today. A brief outline of this talk. Uh, I'll start with uh, some definitions of the terms uh, seabird, bycatch, and uh, gillnet fisheries and give some background uh, information. I'll continue with the two main arcs of my PhD project, which were assessment of seabird bycatch in Danish waters. Uh, that corresponds to uh, paper one and paper two in the thesis and uh, testing effectiveness of seabird bycatch reduction devices in gillnet fisheries, which corresponds to paper three. Um, I'll conclude this presentation with some perspectives and, uh, and ideas for future research. Seabirds uh, are a group of birds that can be characterized by its dependence to the marine environment for at least part of the year. We're talking here about 359 species uh, in 17 families that represent 3.5% of all bird species. They're among the most threatened group of birds in the world and they're known to interact with uh, fishing, uh, fishing operations and fishing vessels in a variety of ways. For instance, by competing on a shared resource, but also by feeding on a on discards or sometimes on baits. And this proximity between seabirds and fishing vessels and fishing operations in general also puts them at risk of, uh, of uh, incidental captures in fishing gears. 
which is what bycatch is. And the term bycatch itself, it refers to any unintentional capture of animals in fishing gears that, in, that includes fish. So from a fisherman viewpoint, uh, bycatch can be desirable if it's a valuable species, but of course, if it's one of the, uh, the animals that we see on the pictures here, it's clearly unwanted. More formally, Lewis and colleagues, oops, uh, I'm sorry about that. They define bycatch as the incidental take of undesirable size or age classes of the target species or incidental take of other non-target species. Bycatch is a global threat for, uh, for birds, for marine mammals, and for turtles that has been documented in all major fisheries worldwide, as uh, these pictures, these, sorry, these maps on the right show. And it has, uh, for some species, an impact at population level. Specifically for seabirds, bycatch uh, has been uh, seen to be the main threat uh, to, for, for the largest number of seabirds in the world. And gillnet fisheries in particular are the type of fisheries that affect uh, the highest number of, of species. However, the magnitude of this impact is poorly known in gillnet fisheries, uh, and that's partly because of a lack of monitoring. Nevertheless, we have uh, seabird mortality estimates in gillnet fisheries that uh, sum up to about 400,000 casualties per year worldwide among which 76,000 happen in the Baltic Sea alone, making the Baltic Sea one of the uh, most problematic uh, areas in the world. I would like to quickly define gillnet fisheries at this point. So uh, I will use the, the term gill, the generic term gillnet throughout the presentation to refer to a different type of static net fisheries, including true gillnets, travel nets, and, and tangling nets. But suffice to say here that gill nets are sheets of netting that are set in a water column and designed to be invisible to target species. They are uh, size selective in that a small fish will tend to swim through the netting uh, while a large fish will tend to bounce off of the netting. And this selectivity can be adjusted by uh, playing on the size of the, of the mesh, so the mesh size, um, the net height, so its slackness, the net length, or, uh, or the soak duration, the time that the net spends uh, underwater. Um, in Denmark, the most frequent type of nets are bottom set gill nets, which you see on the picture in the right hand corner, uh, which are anchored to the seafloor, and uh, a lead line or heavy line keeps uh, permanent contact with the seafloor. Gill nets in Denmark are the most common type of fishing gear, but they contribute to a small fraction of the overall landings uh, in the country. Most vessels in the, in the fleet are uh, relatively small, less than 10 meters, and even for a majority less than 8 meters, as you can see on the bar plot here. Uh, and the majority of the fishing effort, which is uh, the, this bar plot, is for uh, length classes below 12 meters. However, larger vessels, they tend to contribute more than smaller vessels to the overall landings. And to say it another way, uh, for, this, for, for the same number of days spent at sea, large vessels will be able to uh, cast more nets and, uh, than, 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 than smaller vessels and maybe go in deeper water. Therefore, they, they will bring to shore uh, uh, most likely more fish. which is what is written here. Um, there is, because of this overall effort that is spread over a large number of vessels and the relatively low uh, amount of, of fish compared to other uh, large-scale fisheries, uh, lower monitoring efforts in the net fisheries compared to, to, to large-scale and, uh, and fisheries and, and active gears, sorry. And in turn, this has impaired our understanding of uh, seabird bycatch in gillnet fisheries in Denmark, which is important. Uh, th these data are nevertheless important to acquire to, for management purposes to achieve objectives of biodiversity conservation, for instance, and the economic sustainability uh, of these gillnet fisheries. There are 
different ways of monitoring seabird bycatch in gillnet fisheries. Uh, the first one I will talk about are fisheries observers, which constitute a cornerstone of the European Union common fisheries policy. Uh, their work consists of going on board and taking uh, sam samples uh, on board commercial vessels uh, that will be used, for instance, for scientific stock assessment or to evaluate the impact of fisheries on marine ecosystems. Uh, they are expensive, though, uh, to spend on board, and in particular, if a large fraction uh, of the fishing fleet has to be surveyed. In Denmark, uh, fisheries observer, they cover about 0.1% of the overall fishing efforts in commercial gillnet fisheries, which is likely to be, uh, sorry, as a result, rare bycatch events uh, rare seabird bycatch events may likely remain undetected. Logbooks are self-reported data that is provided directly by skippers in the European Union. Logbooks are mandatory from 10 meters and up uh, and 8 meters and up in the Baltic Sea. That's a relatively inexpensive way of collecting data, but it's notoriously lack some information, especially on the uh, bycatch of protected species. Uh, fishing effort in Denmark is reported as days at sea, logbooks, and as I said before, uh, the fish, the, the one day at sea for a large vessel or a small vessel represents, uh, uh, is different, uh, is a, uh, sorry. Uh, anyways, sorry about that. Uh, there is also a risk of bycatch, of, sorry, of bias and misreporting in uh, logbook data. In the absence of direct evidence uh, of bycatch from, say, fisheries observers or logbook registration, one can also ask fishers directly uh, what they catch. Uh, and that's been done, for instance, in, uh, in Germany or in Portugal. In, on the Baltic coast in Germany, uh, the estimate uh, asking fishermen, what the estimate was that 17,000 birds were caught each year uh, in the in gillnet fisheries. There is also a certain risk of bias uh, with using these data, but uh, the authors in Germany assumed that uh, fishers would rather uh, they, they wouldn't uh, exaggerate the number of, of birds that they catch, so they, they said that their estimates were probably conservative. I would also like to talk about electronic monitoring with videos as a way of monitoring seabird bycatch, and simply put, a typical electronic monitoring system consists of the combination of cameras and a GPS that record the whole fishing activity of a fishing vessel and store this data on, on a hard drive. That is, uh, all this data is then sent over the air uh, through Wi-Fi or 3G, 4G to a centralized data software, data storage server. And uh, it's then readily accessible to, um, to data analysts um, from their own computers. What a data analyst would see is this kind of screen. This is a black box analyzer in this case. And we see the one day at sea of a gillnetter in Denmark. The trace, the GPS trace is on the map here. And uh, the upper timeline uh, indicates the time of the day and also the speed of the vessel. So with all this information combined, we can, uh, we can see the fishing activity hauling and setting in particular, which are the purple and blue colors over here. And uh, once we've detected the holes, we can also watch these videos and see if there's any bycatch of seabird and mark it. And all this information feeds a database that can then be used for further uh, statistical analysis. In Denmark, the first trials with electronic monitoring have started in 2008. Uh, they aimed at uh, estimating discards, and uh, it was a success, uh, uh, frank success, and it resulted in extended, in extending, sorry, these uh, these these trials to provide full documentation of fisheries. Um, and the second round of trials also provided uh, fine scale data to evaluate bycatch of a small cetacean called the harbor porpoise, 
in Danish waters and also to establish areas of high risk of incidental captures in Danish waters. So my own PhD was built upon the basis of this previous work with a specific focus on bycatch of seabirds. And with this, I'll uh, jump to the first uh, paper in the thesis, which is entitled <clears throat> Assessing Seabird Bycatch in Gillnet Fisheries Using Electronic Monitoring. It was published in Biological Conservation earlier this year. The objectives of the study were first to analyze the fine scale temporal and spatial variability of fishing activity and seabird bycatch rates using electronic monitoring with videos and to evaluate the interest of electronic monitoring with videos to assess seabird bycatch in gillnet fisheries. The study area is uh, squared here on the map. It's the Ersund uh, in the Western Baltic Sea or uh, Eastern Denmark. And we collected data in this area from three commercial gillnetters equipped with electronic monitoring from 2010 to 2018. What we did was that we uh, identify or we uh, recorded and analyzed 100% of the fishing activity using electronic monitoring with videos. We marked the position of each individual holes and we associated to each one of these holes uh, the corresponding soak time and net length. During these holes, or we watched every one of these holes and we um, and we identified seabird bycatch uh, in these holes, and down we, we identified the, the, the species, the individuals, sorry, down to a species level. For some species, it was possible to also age or sex them. As you can see on the pictures here on the right, starting in the left, uh, upper left corner, we have a uh, common eider, an adult, and just below it, a uh, common eider female. Uh, and in the upper right corner, we have a great cormorant, uh, immature in this case, and just below it, it's a uh, common guillemot. We also calculated uh, the bycatch rates or bycatch per unit effort as the number, the number of birds per trip, which is a widely used metric, and also as the number of birds per net length time, soak time, which is a fine scale uh, measure of bycatch per unit effort. We identified during uh, the study period in this area 700 uh, individual birds. They were captured in 13% of the fishing trips, which is equivalent to 3.5% of the holes that we had observed. Oh, sorry. And the map here on the, on the right shows uh, an overlay of all the all the holes in, in, in yellow and the positions of the bycatch of seabirds are marked in red. 90% of the bycatch that we observed in the area was composed of three species, namely the common eider, which represented 60% of the registered bycatch in the area, the great cormorant, which represented 20%, and the common guillemot, 10%. Less than 10% uh, was made up of uh, different other species from the common, common scotter, velvet scotter, a different type of loons, grebes, and very few seagulls. And in general, more than 99.5% were diving species. We could, thanks to the fine scale data, um, see the seasonal, seasonal variations of bycatch per unit efforts uh, in the area and that uncovered potential uh, bycatch hotspots in the area as the one you can see maybe in fall and winter along the north uh, western coast of uh, Ersund. We saw or we observed uh, some species-specific spatial clustering. Uh, here, the triangles on the map, for instance, are uh, ducks that are mostly gathered along the coast in relatively shallow areas, which corresponds well with their foraging behavior. They, they feed on a, 
on, on tray items that are um, on the, on the seafloor. Whereas if you look more in the south, you'll see uh, greenish or green dots that corresponds to oaks, so common eiders and razor beans, for instance, who, um, who often uh, uh, capture their prey in the pelagic zone, so in, and they were caught accordingly in deeper waters. There was a differential risk of bycatch uh, within some species associated to sex for the common eider, for instance, uh, uh, the common eider were 70% adult males. And for the great cormorant, we saw that more than 50% of the birds that were captured were immature or juveniles. We observed important variations of monthly bycatch rates in the area. The, the mean annual bycatch rate uh, was estimated at 0.34 birds per trip. And you can see here on this plot uh, the, the bycatch rates per month. The mean estimator is the orange dot, and the bars represent the 95% uh, bootstrapped confidence intervals. The numbers on top are the number of trips within its, each strata. But we also saw that 40% of the uh, seabirds were captured in only 14 trips out of 2,118 trips that we had observed. That is 0.7% of all the trips. So we wonder what if we would have missed this trip? For instance, what if we would have uh, wanted to estimate bycatch rates in the area, analyzing only a fraction of the fishing activity? And to see the influence of my bycatch events on the mean estimator, we removed these trips, these 14 trips uh, from the data set, and we replotted the mean bycatch rate estimates. Uh, which ended up in this uh, similar plot. The mean bycatch rates annually by removing these 14 trips dropped to 0.21 birds per trip, which is interesting uh, from a fisheries management point of view because uh, one could argue that for economical reasons, one should analyze only a fraction of the fishing activity that was collected. However, by doing so, it's likely that these uh, mass bycatch events that are unpredictable would be missed. Remember, it's only 0.7% of the trips that we observed. And as a result, the mean uh, bycatch per unit effort estimators would be lower than what they are in, in reality in the area. A summary of this first paper is that electronic monitoring with videos provides a reliable, uh, reliable data in, in small scale gillnet fisheries providing long time series of fine scale uh, fishing efforts and uh, also species specific bycatch rates. There was a clear spatial and temporal variation of bycatch rate in the area, both between species and within species. And bycatch rates from electronic monitoring were likely conservative, are, sorry, are likely conservative if only a fraction of the fishing effort was to be analyzed. And that is, among other things, because rare mass bycatch events represent 40% of the total observed bycatch uh, in this study. Just have a sip of water. The second paper <clears throat> in the thesis is entitled Estimating Seabed Bycatch in Danish Commercial Gillnet Fisheries. The objectives of this study was to first estimate fleet-wide seabird bycatch mortality in the study area and also to identify the ecological and operational factors that explain the observed level of levels of seabird bycatch in this study area. The study area in question are the belt seas that are grayed here on the map. So again, the Western uh, Baltic, Baltic Sea. And we collected uh, data in this area from 2014 to 2018. We, we saw from logbook registrations that 435 vessels, Danish commercial gilnet vessels, were active during this uh, time period, among which six carried electronic monitoring systems. And 48 of them were equipped with something called AIS, Automatic Identification system. These AIS are 
uh, this AI system is a vessel identification system which collects information on the unique vessel uh, identification number, the GPS coordinates uh, of, of the vessel at, at uh, or the current position actually of the vessel, uh, the speed and the course among other things, and then it spreads uh, this, uh, this data omnidirectionally through VHF. And it's been developed originally as an anti-collision system. So here on the map, you can see, it's just a screenshot from a site called marinetraffic.com where you can actually see the vessels equipped with AIS. So you can see their position live. And uh, you can understand the interest from, 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 a, from a, yeah, skipper's uh, viewpoint. In the areas, uh, sorry, also it's important to, to say that AIS is mandatory for vessels above 15 meters in the European Union, uh, but in areas with dense shipping traffic, as is the case in inner Danish waters, which are basically the doors of the Baltic Sea, uh, uh, it's, it is also uh, interesting for safety reasons for smaller vessels to use this AI system, both to see and to be seen by other vessels uh, uh, shipping through. So we use this data and we, again, wanted to have a bycatch estimate at fleet level. So we had a four steps method where we first started with taking our observed data from, from, electronic, monitoring, uh, from electronic monitoring, and we uh, created a model to identify the factors that explain seabed bycatch uh, in the area using uh, something called the generalized linear mixed model. The factors that we included in the, uh, in, in the first model was, uh, were several. They were operational factors and ecological factors. So that include things like uh, the number of nets that were set, the soak time, the net length, uh, also the mesh size, but also the depth, the distance to shore, and uh, temporal uh, dummies, uh, dummy variables like months and year, uh, among others. Then the second step was to model the fishing effort distribution in the area and for that we use these AIS uh, records of a sample of the fleet of these 48 vessels. So here on the map at the bottom you can see the raw AIS data that we used and each uh, the, this, this blue shading is actually a number of points that were recorded and each one of these points carries information on the position of course but also on the speed of the vessel and the position from the position we can infer the depth the distance to shore and a, and a bunch of other variables and the speed also relates relatively well uh, to the fishing activity of the vessel here you can see a histogram of the speed profile of one of the gillnet vessel in our uh, data set and you can see that low speeds or we know that low speeds are associated to hauling that is uh, the action of uh, taking the nets out of the water because uh, a skipper will always uh, will need to go not too fast to, to hold up the net. Whereas higher speeds are associated to other type of fishing activity that's like setting, that is putting the net in the water or steaming going from A to B uh, with the, the, the vessel. Um, Previous work showed that the simple uh, speed filter does not work well to predict the fishing activity for gillnet fisheries and for passive gears in general. So we, we created a, a generalized uh, linear model with a binomial, um, uh, with a, using a binomial family, and we included also uh, environmental parameters in, in the model. So this is what we did. To validate the accuracy of the model, we needed to have observed data. And thankfully, we had that from uh, the electronic monitoring. So what we basically did is what we took we, that we took the subsample of um, uh, vessels with both electronic monitoring and AIS, or, uh, and, and we compared the validity of our uh, fishing effort distribution model using AIS records to the reality of what we had observed uh, with uh, the electronic monitoring data. Then we had these two models, and then we predicted the fine scale variations of bycatch rates by combining these two previous models. So we had uh, uh, an estimate of bycatch for these 48 vessels that we had included in our uh, uh, fishing 
effort distribution. We then uh, average this over different strata, uh, the, the, the area and also uh, the year and month. And finally, we could uh, take the same strata from, uh, from the logbooks and uh, scale up the bycatch rate estimates to the entire fleet. This, these results, so starting with the seabird bycatch model, we uh, observed in this area that the uh, main predictors of, uh, of seabird bycatch were depth, net length, soak time, distance to show, and month, all being significant. However, mesh size was not found to be significant in, uh, in our model in this area. The model predicted much fewer bycatch uh, from April to October, which uh, we also expected. We predicted uh, holes from our AES data, and this is just an overlay of the raw AES data on the map uh, in blue, uh, and on top of it are the predicted holes. We compared that uh, data from uh, our electronic monitoring data, and we saw that the accuracy of the model was fairly good. It was 81%. So we, we moved forward with it, and we calculated that the bycatch rate estimates in the area, the, at, at least the annual uh, mean bycatch rate, were 0 0.24 seabird per fishing trip, which, um, then uh, allowed us to, uh, to scale up and calculate fleet-wide bycatch mortality uh, in both areas. And it summed up to 2,265 seabirds, which uh, are considered conservative estimates. So a summary of paper two, as I just said, uh, we calculated that total seabird bycatch was approximately 2,265 birds per year in the Baird Seas, which and those estimates are in line with the uh, previous studies in the region, uh, which state that the Baltic Sea actually have a relatively high um, uh, bycatch, uh, seabird bycatch rate. So there is a relatively high seabird bycatch rate in the, in the Baltic Sea. These results are also four times higher than what was reported in Norway from a a previous study that, that used a, a similar approach. The best predictors uh, of bycatch in the area were found to be, uh, again, depths. I'll come back to the, 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 the point before. Uh, just, yep, yeah, depth, net length, soak time, distance to shore, and months, but not mesh size. And I skipped the line, I'm sorry. Fleet wide seabird bycatch mortality uh, could be estimated combining uh, information from electronic monitoring from AIS, logbook and sales note uh, data. And finally, it was, uh, it was possible in this area to, um, to model the spatial distribution of a gillnet fishing effort using AIS records. So now, a big question uh, to start with the second part of my PhD, why are seabirds captured in gillnets? Well, there are some factors in previous studies that have been associated to uh, higher uh, uh, seabird bycatch rates. For instance, the location of, uh, of the nets, the season, the time of the day, uh, also technical factors like mesh size and net heights, environmental factor like the water depth, and also behavioral factor like vision or audition. And, um, Sensory ecology is uh, attempting to understand the information that is valuable to an animal when uh, carrying out tasks in a particular environment. And having this information is interesting if one wants to uh, create ways to uh, reduce these, uh, these, these, these events, these bycatch events. So for that, it's interesting to know how uh, the, the birds perceive their environment and um, most agree that uh, vision is a primary or the primary sense underwater for most seabirds. However, uh, studies have also showed that uh, seabirds usually have a very low visual acuity 
for the great cormorant, for instance, it's comparable to that of a human. That means that if, they, if you go underwater and open your eyes, you will see a blur, just like a great uh, cormorant would. Audition uh, is also an important sense and definitely a major sense for many birds and including uh, seabirds. Um, but it's only recently that it's been showed that some seabirds, at least they can detect auditory cues while diving. Again, the great cormorant being one of them. Uh, even more recently, uh, both the great cormorant and the Gentoo penguin, uh, or for both these birds, uh, we have seen that they do have adaptations to underwater hearing, which suggests that they might be able to uh, hear directionally underwater, to pinpoint the direction of a sound, if you will. The sense of touch is particularly developed in bentivorous species, uh, numerous sea ducks like the common eider feed on, uh, for the common eider, for instance, the favorite prey item is, is the, the blue mussel, which they find on the seafloor. And then they need to forage the, the, the sediments or the, the seafloor for finding it. So they have a, a lot of innovation around the uh, Olfaction, to the best of my knowledge at least, is not used as a sense uh, underwater for foraging uh, birds. Now with that and as an introduction, I'll uh, talk about the last paper in my thesis, which is entitled Lights Reduce Seabird Bycatch in a Western Baltic Sea. They may sell gillnet fishery, but pingers do not. The objectives of the study was to test, were to test the effectiveness of flashing white LED lights, not, known as net lights, as a mean to reduce seabird bycatch in Danish gillnets and to test the effectiveness of three kilohertz acoustic fingers to do the same. The study area was the Ersun again, which is squared here on the map. We, used, we hired uh, one commercial gillnetter that was equipped with electric monitoring, uh, and we ran the experiment in the winter 2018-2019. So the question was, um, do the tested bycatch reduction devices, so either lights or pingers, reduce bycatch rates for all seabirds taken together? And for groups of seabirds, like bentivorous species, here we see on top uh, velvet scotters and uh, common eiders in the bottom. And for pelagic, pelagic sorry, feeding seabirds, like uh, from the top, the great cormorant, the common guillemot, and the razorbill that are all present uh, in the area. We, we did, the experimental setup consisted of two pairs of net fleets uh, for each of these uh, bycatch reduction devices that I'm going to show you in a moment. We used one control and I, uh, one experimental net, sorry, on which we had uh, these devices and then one identical control uh, without these devices, and we set the nets in the same fishing locations uh, for the same amount of time, so at the same depths, and etc. And then we release them there, we, we, we hold up the nets. The bycatch devices that we did test were uh, net lights, they are manufactured by Fish, Fishtech Mar Marine in the UK, uh, and they emit a flashing white uh, signal. We spaced them uh, alternatively on the headline and, and, and sink line every 10 meters. And we also tested acoustic pingers. Um, the output signal was centered at 3 kilohertz at the uh, power of 145 decibel, and the spacing was 12.5 meters. The results of this experiment, for the net lights, we had 38 valid pairs. Uh, and we caught 12 birds in the experimental nets and 15 in the controls. Here you can see um, the large dots are the mean difference in bycatch per unit effort between the controls and the, the experimental nets. And the, the bars, the error bars are the 95% uh, bootstrapped confidence intervals. So, uh, randomization tests suggest that if these uh, confidence intervals don't overlap zero, then the tests could be uh, considered significant. 
In, uh, for the lights, what we saw was that uh, there was no effect of lights on all birds taken together or on uh, benthic forages. But for pelagic feeders, there might be here, as you can see in blue, uh, there, there, there might be a, um, uh, a small reduction of, uh, of bycatch per unit effort using lights. We also ran a test called the Wilcoxon sign rank test, which uh, was the p value was 0 0.1, which was non significant. The pingers had 41 valid uh, pairs and 10 birds were caught in the experimental nets while 12 were caught in the controls. Uh, we saw on average a small reduction in uh, bycatch rates using the pingers, but they were found to be non-significant according to this test, as you can see here on the right. As a summary, we concluded that there was no effect of 3 kilohertz pingers on seabird bycatch, which is unlike what was reported uh, in the US almost 20 years ago in, uh, in the sound and drift net fisheries, uh, where they used uh, a pinger that was uh, centered at one kilohertz and where they observed a, a reduction of bycatch of common guillemot, common MERS over there uh, in, in the drift nets. We saw no, if, or we observed no effects of flashing white lights, the net lights on bentivorous species, which is unlike the results that were reported from Lithuania from uh, Field and colleagues last year. Uh, who were using the same lights, the exact same lights with the same uh, um, uh, flashing sequence. And uh, they observed an increase in bycatch rates of long-tailed ducks in, these, uh, in this fishery. Finally, we observed a small reduction uh, of bycatch rates for pelagic feeding species when using net lights. However, we, uh, we say that these results are based on few observations and should be considered inconclusive until more data are collected. I'll now sum up the main findings of uh, this PhD research, starting with uh, the part about the assessment of seabird bycatch in Danish waters. We saw that electronic monitoring with videos is an effective tool to assess seabird bycatch in small-scale gillnet fisheries in Denmark, and that it brings uh, information on an otherwise largely ignored issue in the segment of the commercial fleet in Denmark. There was evidence of high seabird bycatch rates in coastal Danish waters, uh, and as such, uh, electronic monitoring has increased our understanding of the extent of seabird mortality in gillnets. Um, and it comes in these regards as a complement of onboard fisheries observers' data. There was evidence of species specific vulner vulnerability to bycatch uh, in gillnets. And also, yeah, also, sorry. And also, we saw that there was difference, differences uh, within species regarding age or sex. And that's actually important uh, to see that because this information might feed uh, uh, models in the future and, in general, help to understand how bycatch may affect the, the structure of uh, individual uh, populations in the study area. Mass bycatch events uh, constituted a large fraction of the total seabird bycatch mortality, which is important to consider if future sampling programs base their uh, bycatch estimate, estimations on analyzing only a fraction of uh, the, the overall, uh, the, the whole fishing activity. Estimating fleet-wide seabird mortality was possible combining electronic monitoring, uh, automatic identification system, and logbook and sales notes. Uh, data. And the estimates uh, are deemed to be conservative uh, with uh, our electronic monitoring data, uh, deemed to the, 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 the voluntary nature of, uh, of the sampling scheme, that the, higher, the hired skippers were all volunteers. And it's important to consider this from a management, uh, fisheries management viewpoint. Now about the bycatch reduction devices, the effectiveness of seabird bycatch reduction devices in gillnet fisheries. Uh, we saw that three kilohertz pingers were not effective at reducing bycatch rates, whereas 
uh, flashing white lights did not affect bycatch rates of bentivir species. However, they may have, they might have reduced the bycatch rates of uh, pelagic feeding seabirds in this, uh, in this area. Finally, perspectives and future research. I just have a sip of water. The European Union legislation that surrounds the fishery sectors has now, is now engaged in a, something called an ecosystem approach to fisheries management um, that tends to include all the components of the ecosystem into, into uh, uh, or take them into consideration. And the lack of monitoring that we've had in, uh, in, for many years in small scale fisheries and it's particularly in, in gillnet fisheries has, has impaired our capacity to understand the extent of the bycatch problem and maybe to act and to remediate. So uh, such programs that uh, I've presented here, the electronic monitoring program, which is a collaboration between fishers, between scientists and the authorities uh, has helped advance research uh, both to understand the extent of the problem, but also to test bycatch reduction devices. But some questions remain at the end of this PhD that I would have liked to answer, such as what is the impact of bycatch in gillnets, in gillnet fisheries, on individual seabird populations in Denmark? And for that, uh, I will need to uh, rerun, and I've started to do that, the estimates that I've showed you uh, uh, per, for individual species. So for instance, for the common eider for which we have uh, the most data. And then we'll need to uh, run uh, models, uh, pop, um, population dynamic models, some things like a population viability analysis to know whether the level, the current level of bycatch is a threat uh, uh, in the long run for these populations that we're uh, studying. What will definitely help uh, to have more precise bycatch mortality estimate is, will be to use the seabird uh, densities, um, either seasonal or, or, or over, over, over the year. Another big question is how can we actually reduce seabird bycatch or suppress seabird bycatch in gillnets? And uh, there is for sure uh, some things that could be done like some behavioral studies in a control environment. For instance, uh, we, would, we, we wish we, could, we, we can in the future test uh, some, um, some, some, some lights or, or, or even acoustic devices on uh, some species like the, the common guillemot in a controlled environment. Uh, we will also run experiments next year on experimental trials in commercial uh, fisheries that are known to have a high bycatch problem and that, that have been overlooked up until now, like the lump sucker uh, fishery. Uh, this is, yeah, that fish over here. And we will use net lights to, uh, to, to, to see if we can reduce, or if it does reduce um, bycatch of uh, alcides in particular. We will also test aerial scarers. This is a uh, courtesy from Jan Uxell in, at BirdLife. Uh, they are being tested currently in the Eastern Baltic. We will test them next year on pound nets uh, in Denmark, uh, in particular to see whether this type of scaring devices uh, uh, generates uh, uh, long lasting, um, a long lasting effect or if there is uh, some sort of habituation. And finally, we have collected uh, a high number of uh, birds during these three and a half years uh, that have been frozen and are now being autopsied. And we will run, among other things, stomach content analysis, also to and some genetic uh, studies to associate these dead birds to their uh, population of origin, and also to um, sex them and, and, and see if they have other interesting things. And with this, I will say thank you. And I, I really mean it to uh, the assessment committee for reading my work, for giving me thorough feedback. I really appreciate that, uh, especially for the two papers that are uh, to be published in the future. I'll say thanks to these two over here, Finn and Lotte. Uh, yeah, I cannot say that enough, but I'll say it again. And also to, uh, well, too many people actually have a, have a short list here, but the, the PhD students here at Aqua, uh, they know themselves, I don't need to name, name them. Some of them are here, some are not. I wish they were. 
Uh, I would like to say thanks uh, to Morten Frederiksen at uh, uh, in Riese in uh, Aarhus University for, uh, for, for, for accepting me as a guest at the university. That was a great experience and thank you again for that and all the people in Riese. And I would like, since I have a little bit of time, to say thanks to Liz, our secretary, to Rike, to the members of the PhD school and uh, the best for the end, I'll say thanks to Louise up here. And yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Losing my voice. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm done now. Yeah, thank you very much, Silda. We have a short break, so uh, we break for five minutes and we will continue at uh, uh, 1.55, that is five minutes to two. Uh, okay, we are back for the second part of uh, the proceedings and uh, I was informed in advance that uh, Simon is going to start with the discussions and then Dominic, but you are also switching a big uh, back and forth for each of the topics uh, and that's a really good way to have a vivid discussion. Um, so having that said, I would like to give the word to Simon, uh, please go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm assuming you can hear me okay. Yes, good. Um, first, uh, just to say congratulations, and um, I really enjoyed reading this thesis. Uh, um, very nicely thought through, uh, very good work. Um, and particularly, I was impressed with the, um, the conciseness and the way in which you'd written it. I guess English is probably your second or third language, uh, but I thought it was, that was, it was really good. Um, and one of the things I picked out uh, when I was first reading the introduction was the way in which you've very nicely given an overview of the kind of legislative underpinnings of uh, why we should care about um, seabird bycatch. Uh, and you, you go into that as well, I think, in, in, in one of the papers that you, you describe the various contortions and, and, and differences amongst the different um, agencies and uh, supranational agreements about what a definition should be for a target for bird bycatch uh, limits. So it seems to me that these a lot of the time are, are, are in conflict with one another. So there are a lot of kind of tensions within um, the policy drivers there. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that in terms of whether you think the drivers that we're working towards are really grounded in conservation policy or to what extent they're driven by other issues or other concerns. And furthermore, what you think the consequences of all of these various different targets might be for both for, for monitoring studies, but also for bycatch mitigation studies. Because it seems to me that there are some quite far reaching implications uh, depending on which of the various targets that you were to adopt. So I wonder if you've got any thoughts about that. I'm sorry, that's a fairly philosophical question to start with, but- Yeah, uh, almost, but I mean, that, that is a very interesting point. Um, and there are several things. I mean, yes, indeed, the, the legislation in the EU, at least, uh, is made in such a way that it sometimes seems to contradict itself, uh, especially the common fisheries policy having uh, the, the certain number of, of, of goals, let's say, and uh, uh, the habitats and the birds directive having uh, definitely other type of goals, conservations, uh, conservation in this case. About the targets, I'm a bit, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because, uh, uh, and I think somebody pointed this out, that it's hard to say, well, such a number of birds is too ma are too many birds because we, we know so little about the population dynamics of some of the concerned populations. Besides that, we know so little about how many birds are actually captured uh, in, in the gears every year. So. Well, that, that is at least to talk about the problem itself. Now, to come back to uh, the legislation, which was, is the most influential? That was some sort of uh, the question that, that, that you asked. Uh, I think, um, I, I guess I, I have to say it depends. It depends uh, from, from which point of view you look at it. Uh, I think, or well, I think, I, I, the common fisheries policy has evolved a lot since it was first uh, created many years ago now. There's another um, 
revision of the of the common fisheries policy that is coming and i think i'm not the only i'm not the only one to hope that it will be more uh, taking into account different uh, compartments of the ecosystem including seabirds and not just sustainability of uh, some uh, some a few uh, important yeah but a few stocks uh, that 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 we exploit. Um, so yeah, there's there's different things. There's collecting more data uh, from from, for instance, with what we've been doing here with the electronic monitoring of uh, bycatch of uh, protected species that will then help. And that's really my wish here, more than my thought. But uh, 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 managers and maybe people deciding on these policies. Um, to take care of or to pay attention to these uh, to these issues, so yeah, I don't know if it's really the the answer that you you you're sort of expecting, but uh, yeah, um, I suppose uh, it seems to me there there is a tension in some of these things between um, a, a sector of society that were would really want there to be no bycatch of anything at all, uh, for whom even a very small number of birds is too many. And perhaps at another extreme, um, a sector of society that would think, well, as long as these things are not currently going extinct, it's fine. And of course, those two extreme positions, um, uh, yeah, sure, they're contradictory, but um, they also make it very difficult to um, define what the management objectives should be in terms of, say, bycatch mitigation, also make it really difficult to uh, plan monitoring, how much monitoring you actually need to do to answer those sorts of questions and then somewhere in the middle there's there's the idea somehow that bycatch shouldn't harm the population but what that actually means um, is is kind of a very open question and you know as you discuss in your thesis I mean there's lots of different ways of, of, of looking at that and I think for me at least it's always been a bit of a frustration that we don't really have any clear guidance from policymakers as to what it is that we're supposed to be actually um, driving towards here um, I mean, if, if you if you really do want to get the bycatch rate down to 0.1% of natural mortality, then clearly a mitigation measure which only reduces bycatch by 10 or 20% is completely useless. Um, so there are there are a lot of kind of ramifications from um, what the what the policy um, should be. So I guess that's really what I was trying to uh, get some feeling for. You know, where where you are on that spectrum uh, between um zero and it's fine as long as they're not going extinct <laughs> well i'm uh, i'm probably around the middle uh i mean i, I can see that uh, let, let's start with uh, with um uh, gillnet fisheries and gillnet fishermen uh as it is now uh gillnet fisheries i mean and it's not a point of view i mean it's uh some sort of a three three f uh, thing. It's a f uh, fuel friendly fishery uh, or, or fuel efficient fishery. So I mean, in this sense, uh, this is the kind uh, of of fisheries that actually we want. They they catch fish uh, in in the way they catch fish, and there is bycatch, and that is a problem that we need to address. But if you just look at what they bring to shore, they bring high quality fish. They make up uh, a, a, a nice livelihood for fishing communities in many places that maybe otherwise wouldn't have such a, uh, or th basically some many people are dependent on these fisheries. So yes, it's a small fraction of the landings and, uh, and, and yes, uh, there, there is this problem of bycatch. But I mean, with that said, that we need to um, sort of uh, uh, keep these small fisheries alive. Uh, uh, I think it's important uh, for, for, for also for the sustainability reasons. But uh, uh, yes, we also need to address this bycatch problem, not just of seabirds for that matter, but also of other protected species. And, um, and I don't have the solution right now. I don't, I don't of course, you know, it, it's important that these populations don't go extinct. So if we see that there's a um, I'm going to take an extreme example, uh, sorry for the extreme, but take the vaquita in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we need to stop that. There's no other way. I mean, if the vaquita is to survive, there's no fishing period. But we're talking about an extreme example here. And there is a, there is a um, like take the common eider, which is in Denmark, the most common uh, uh, captured species in gillnets. The common eider is being hunted. Or at least the males are being hunted. Uh, and um, and this is important 
to keep that in, uh, in consideration when one say, well, we need to reduce bycatch of common eiders. Yes, but maybe it's not such a big deal, say, compared to hunting. So maybe uh, instead of putting the pressure on, on and it's, again, it's, this is a political decision. Instead of putting the pressure on fishers, then we should put the pressures maybe on hunters. I don't really have the, the, the answer to that. And I also don't have the, the, the answer to this because maybe we should see if the current level of bycatch and what is what we expect it to become in the future actually put these populations uh, at, 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 at risk. Maybe it doesn't. I think we've gathered information that suggests that it does. But this, uh, this needs more maybe a modeling approach. And then it goes through the, the whole ramifications of the, 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 the political ramifications, as you said before, maybe something is enacted and, and to protect them. Um, yeah, I guess mm -hmm. I'm in between. I guess I'm in between. Yeah, I mean, common eye is maybe a good example. I mean, that's not exactly um, on its way to extinction, as far as I understand at the minute. There are there are a lot of them. So you might say, well, you know, if you want to have gillnet fishing, um, which for the reasons that you outlined already, may be a good thing, then you're always going to have to put up with some some level of bycatch of of common eye. the chances of being able to eliminate it completely are probably very remote. Um, but just to follow on from that about the whole issue of, of uh, fishing policy and so on, I, one of the interesting things I noticed in, um, which I only just noticed in your presentation, is the graph that you showed of the number of, of gillnet boats in Danish waters, which um, had been declining um, throughout 2012 to 2017, which on the face of it would suggest is a good thing for bycatch because it must therefore be going down. Um, but then in 2018, there was a sudden uh, jump up in the, both the numbers of boats and the amount of fishing effort. Um, and, you know, again, you might say, well, that's a good thing if people are not trawling or something anymore, damaging the seabed and burning fuel. But do you know why that there's been an increase in, tw in 2018? Um, this is actually a question I've been uh, asking myself. Uh, you, you, you point at it, it's good. I don't have the answer, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if, if you look at the numbers, uh, just the sheer numbers, uh, I think there was like twice as many or even more uh, in the early 90s or mid 90s. So it's really, really, really decreased a lot in Denmark uh, in the last 25 years or so. Or so. Yeah, I think um, it has throughout Europe. Yeah. Yeah. And, and throughout Europe. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and that's commercial uh, fishers. So yeah, I, I don't know. Some I remember someone say, I remember, maybe it was, Esther. anyways, that, um, that simply fisherm fishermen were getting old and leaving. So maybe there's a new generation coming uh, from uh, 18 and onwards. I, I don't know about that. But that, that, yeah, that is a good question. Yeah. I guess yeah. maybe Ludwig would know more if, uh, if yeah. No. <laughs> All right. Well, I, why don't I see if one of the others has a, has a, has a question to, to yes. follow up from, from those. Hey, hello. Hi, Dominic. Uh, Gilda, uh, thank you very much for your good presentation. Very nice. And uh, First uh, of all, before I start to asking your question, I would like to say that, similar to Simon, I'm impressed of your thesis, both in terms of work input and uh, its quality. Uh, I think the common, uh, common aspect of all three articles and is that they are very interesting and important scientifically, and they are applicable in practice. So technically, the technical solutions, especially for monitoring of bycatch, can be used in the larger scale. Uh, so I think uh, your articles will have significant impact of, of still little known and generally uh, ignored issues of, uh, of uh, seabird bycatch. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, my first question is uh, is uh, mm, uh, about monitoring because in your study uh, there were uh, ships about 10 meters long and uh, they were vessels with wheelhouse 
So this is the place where the camera and other uh, parts of electronic uh, monitoring can be mounted. So similar study of uh, bycatch monitoring was uh, carried out in Poland, uh, testing of different, different type of uh, monitoring. Uh, uh, I personally didn't take part in them, but I, uh, but I heard that there were a problem of installing electronic monitoring in very small boats without wheelhouse. In Poland and I think in uh, some other Eastern European country like Lithuania and Latvia, there is a large proportion of uh, very small ships without uh, uh, without wheelhouse and in uh, in lagoons almost all uh, so below they, they are very small below uh, below eight eight meters uh, so in the same time they they are responsible for quite a large part of bycatch so uh, do you know what is in, uh, in in Danish water? Do you have some, such uh, small vessels without wheelhouse? And do you think on that uh, small vessels we can install mode that electronic monitoring what you use? Um, thanks for your question. Uh, I think it's a very very interesting thing to look at the the technical developments in the of the electronic monitoring systems actually. Um, there are in Denmark uh, a, a large number of recreational fishermen, for instance, uh, that use uh, maybe few gill nets, but uh, from, and that they, they, they set their nets from, from, from small boats. They're also, I'm not, I'm not quite sure about the number of uh, commercial uh, gill netters uh, that are very, very small. I could, I could check that. Uh, but that's true. I mean, the, the cameras that we use, they are uh, rugged uh, cameras. We need a wheelhouse. We need the power, uh, among other things, uh, to, to, to run this whole thing. I mean, it's basically a computer that's installed in, in the wheelhouse. So for commercial uh, gillnetters that are a certain size, it's not a problem. They already have equipment, plotters, and so on. And, and for smaller vessels without, uh, uh, without a cover, basically, that can be more uh, problematic. So I know that there's been some things that have been developed here that are not that small proof of concept yet than anything, but that, are, that is a portable, uh, some sort of a um, yeah, briefcase, if you want, uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, electronic monitoring system that you can in, like put on the, 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 the vessel itself. Uh, and that is uh, powered, uh, with, that is, it has its own power. I'm also thinking, and that's just out of my head because I don't actually remember the name, but uh, there is um, a large float, a large uh, a fleet, sorry, of, um, uh, of uh, very small uh, gillnet vessels that operate in, uh, in, uh, in the Pacific coast of South America and in Peru, for instance, where uh, these, uh, also in Brazil, as far as I remember, and these, uh, in these places, they have, uh, well, in Chile, sorry, not in Peru, uh, in these places, they, they have uh, uh, some very small electronic monitoring system that consists basically of a GPS that's linked to uh, some sort of an action cam, you know, like a GoPro or something that records the whole thing. And then when the, the fishes go, uh, go back to shore, then they uh, either uh, upload the data directly or they, or they just transfer the, the SD card and, and so on. And so these data can also be exploited. It's not as, um, as it may not be as rich as what we have, but for very small vessels, that works fine. I mean, GoPros are not red cameras, but they are pretty, uh, GoPro and all the equivalents, not to cite a, a brand, but uh, they, 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 they work pretty pretty well. So I know that it's been devel developed, and I, 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 could, I, I cannot find the, the, the name of uh, this person out of the back of my head, but I could, I could find it if you're interested in knowing more in what's been developed in, in Chile, for instance. Yeah, yeah. That would be very interesting because, because as I said, the, the, the problem in, in Poland is, uh, is with these very, very small ships um, uh, and the, 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 that would be the problem of installing some kind of uh, monitoring what, what, what 
you have used. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's also difficult because the, the, the boat are so small to, to, to have observer on board. Uh, so, so there is no uh, way to monitor, but in the same time, this is, this is the, the, they are responsible for, for quite a large part of, uh, of, uh, of bycatch. So the, the, another, another thing is to, to have uh, another boat and to, to follow. To go, yeah, to follow, to follow together, together with uh, fishermen, and to observe uh, them or, or use uh, some kind of drones. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, the, the, I'm the, thinking the of. Oh, sorry, to cut you. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm I'm just thinking of another solution that's been developed in um, in Rostock University, or oh, I, I think that's them. Uh, but where they use a mobile phone app that the, the skippers, uh, the fishermen can download and it's called Mofi and that tracks the, 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 the position, for instance, of the fishing vessel uh, while, you know, they are, they, are, they are fishing. And if they record a fishing event that is interesting, like bycatch a seabird, for instance, they can literally, you know, press a button and then take a picture and all this feeds the... Uh, uh, a database that is uh, accessible to, to scientists. So if you have in these uh, in these fleets that uh, that is problematic in the in the lagoons in Poland, volun volun volunteer uh, skippers that want to uh, to use this this kind of uh, app on their phone, that could actually be interesting because from from their point of view, it's also a nice thing to see. Okay, well, I have the track of my vessel. I've been fishing here and there. Uh, they can use it uh, more or less as a as a as a plotter. Uh, same thing. I can I can share the contact. I think Steffi in uh, in Rostock. Okay, more. Yeah, yeah. That'll be that that'll be interesting. Uh, okay, I have uh, uh, another another question uh, about uh, bycatch estimation, but uh, I I just wonder whether we go in this in this turn or uh, uh, or next turn. You decide. Okay, so 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 I I go with that. Uh, so the results of your second article relate to estimated of bycatch number, yeah. all bird together. Well, this is very interesting and valuable information. It might be worthwhile trying to estimate bycatch of individual species. Such information would be much more useful, especially uh, uh, for distinguishing between species of different conservation status and could then be referred to the mortality threshold of those species. So such thresholds differ, differ and in different species and depend on their biology and conservation status. This is especially important in the current situation of implementation of a marine strategy framework directive and its update from 2017, it imposes an obligation for EU member states to monitor bycatch and to set thresholds for each species exposed. An example now is a greater scope uh, from our last article. Uh, so the wintering in northern and western Europe, the threshold uh, mm, uh, that will not affect the population with, we, is about 400 individuals per year, whereas the estimated bycatch is 10 times more, 4,000 individuals per year. On this basis, we can determine the target to be achieved when attempting to minimize bycatch. So the question is, Based on your data, are you able to provide a bycatch estimate for individual species? And uh, could you could you list uh, uh, what 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 was the, the the species in your second study? Uh, yes. So I. Uh, two things here. I, I've read this article that I really liked, by the way. I'm not saying that because you're here. I actually really liked it. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was a good source of inspiration. Um, and, and yes, I don't know if I can... I, do I have a shared screen here? How does that work? Can I, can I maybe show you? Because I, I added uh, something to the, uh, to the 
thesis. So if I do, just tell me if you can see the presentation yes. again. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. Done. So that, that's just, you know, additional slides that I didn't use, but yeah, maybe, yeah, that was this one. So that's from uh, the same data that I used for paper two. And I refitted the model, um, the bycatch model, just using uh, information on bycatch of uh, common riders. I did not uh, split between sex and because, yeah, I wanted to have enough, um, uh, enough samples basically uh, to, to, to calculate these estimates. So of course, the more data, the, the, the better the, the estimates, obviously. And uh, the common rider is the most common uh, species in the bycatch uh, data set. So I calculated for these two areas, so uh, inner Danish waters, that the, the conservative estimate of the of yearly fleet-wide bycatch mortality was between uh, 1,100 and about uh, uh, um, uh, 1,500 individuals uh, per year. And if we take these conservation estimates, it would be between 0.17 and 0.32% of uh, the population estimates, and I took these numbers from the from this uh, BirdLife International report. Um, so yeah, I mean, and then you can discuss whether that that is too high. As I said before, uh, uh, we uh, mm -hmm. uh, to Simon, uh, eiders are are also hunted. So this is a, a source of uh, anthropogenic mortality that adds to uh, uh, to 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 hunting, but also to uh, uh, sheep strikes or windmills uh, that, that that also affect these populations, and also uh, on land for the for the for the for the breeders, uh, there's uh, there's the problem of um, of the depredation from uh, red foxes or from uh, mm. uh, eagles, for okay. instance. That is also a problem for these species. But anyways, I mean, this is this is a way I think we we can uh, maybe. Um, uh, um, sort of yeah address and you know i'm aware that the second paper as it is now uh, is interesting uh, uh in itself i think i really hope so That's at right, least yeah. and and also as a proof of concept but there are like most people have asked me so what about the thresholds so what do you think we we should do is it too much is it not and i think that for uh, the common riders maybe yeah we could we could uh, we could uh, start with these species to start answering uh, uh, this question it, it would be interesting to do it in a in a more um, advanced way but i think that would be for another publications where we actually use uh, basically what you did for the um, uh, uh, in, in, this pub, in, in this manuscript that you, that you published earlier this year, uh, where we have, for instance, a population viability analysis, where we some, some sort of forecast into the future uh, what the population uh, might become given different uh, scenario. Um, so yeah, that's on the yeah. That I mean, I've started working on this already, at least for the common rider. Mm -hmm. Now for the great cormorant. Uh, which is in this area the second most bycott species. Uh, there might be enough data. I need to look into this. And and for the common guillemot, which is uh, one of the few species in the Baltic Sea, as far as I remember, we, where we actually have this threshold that have been set by Helcom. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I don't want to say too much, but I think we're clearly above the threshold. That's, that's, out of the out of my head, I think the threshold is 600 per year. Pretty sure we're above that. Okay. Especially, okay. especially in some in some in some areas uh, in the in the Western Baltic, in some fisheries. Well, sorry, in the Western Baltic. Well, for these uh, three species, uh, you are able to to estimate bycatch. Uh, for the common eider, yes. Uh, for the great cormorant and for the common guillemot, I'm. Uh, or oh, um, it's not just me, but we've, yeah. been, we've been collecting uh, uh, more data, so I need to, to rerun uh, these models for these species. I think that as, at the moment, we, add, we don't have enough data for the, for the common guillemot, and it's, uh, it, it's a bit borderline for the, for the very common. But basically what it means is that, uh, uh, I mean, we can calculate these estimates based on any sample size, but it's just that the confidence intervals are going to be immensely big. Uh, and That's right. Yeah, yeah. But but I think better is to put uh, some number with big 
confidence intervals, then 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 nothing. You can you can even use something like very simple calculation just to to have an idea how many. Uh, so if you if you have a, a estimated bycatch of all species, and then you have you have uh, raw data of uh, of, of birds uh, drawn in uh, fishing net, you have you you can just do a simple calculation of how how many percent how how many percent of uh, non gulimot or, or other species were, and then you uh, you, uh, you you have this from from the uh, estimation of all species together. Uh, yes. uh, tell, tell me uh, one more thing because this estimation, uh, for example, this is uh, one uh, one thousand to one thousand four hundred, is for which part of Danish Sea? This is this uh, this belt sea uh, uh, shadowed on grey on your on your map. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, and and the reason for that, uh, well, there's several reasons actually for just focusing for this paper number two on this area is that when uh, I did start working on this paper, the, the data that we had collected was mostly from this area, and we were sort of late in other areas like Skagerrak, where we know that we also have a bycatch problem, actually bycatch of other uh, protected species like pop is also problematic over there. But uh, anyway, so we, we focus on this area. We are now collecting or we started collecting uh, bycatch in Kattegat, which is, uh, which seems to show that there's a bigger problem even in this area, at least for some species especially uh, pelagic uh, feeding species. Um, so yeah, we, we've been gathering more information, but, but when I was uh, working on this paper, uh, yeah, I needed to restrict to the area to, 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 get, uh, to get going, if, if, if you will. Um, and there was something, sorry, I wanted to say. Yeah, also, I think what was interesting in the, in the, in the bycatch data that we collected is that, you know, we have information uh, on bycatch of velvet scotters, for instance, which, uh, uh, which is, uh, I don't remember, I think it's vulnerable uh, on the red list. Yeah, yeah, vulnerable. And so well. It would be interesting, of course, to uh, actually know if there is a link uh, uh, between, between yeah, uh, the number of birds that are captured and maybe the, the, the state of the populations. Although for velvet scotters, I think, I think yeah, there's a problem at the, at the breeding sites, as far as far as I know, more than a bycatch. But yeah, uh, and and also the main the main place for uh, wintering of velvet scotter in more east in Polish, uh, yes. Russian and Lithuanian waters, and there is also a big problem of bycatch. So 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 um, I think we, we could look at what is going on in breeding site and also also in wintering site in, in, in Eastern Baltic. Uh, okay, I, I have uh, another questions about uh, about uh, um, uh, common scooters, but maybe uh, uh, we will go. Uh, uh, we will leave it now and and uh, go to Ludwig and and then uh, come back if we if we have time. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. First, I would like to thank you for a really good presentation. Uh, it was clear and it was well structured. And I would say with the thesis that you handed in, I also expected that of you, Jules. Thanks. Um, I work in fisheries technology. I have worked a lot with bycatch of fish. I have never worked with birds. So this is a new area for me. But I would say that I really enjoy reading your thesis. For, thank you for that. Uh, the synopsis is very well written. It's very well structured. It's supported clear uh, by clear and relevant figures and tables uh, throughout. The thesis, uh, I would say, increased the general knowledge of bird bycatch, um, of bird bycatch mitigation, uh, specifically by quantifying bird bycatch spatial temporarily and at a fleet level through modeling. And so it gives a comprehensive overview of bycatch uh, of birds and gillnets, but in addition, uh, data availability, data sources, modeling of such data structures, and also acoustic and visual deterrent strategies to reduce bycatch and an insights into how birds may percept such uh, stimuli. 
The synopsis, uh, in my opinion, integrates and presents very well both the motivation for and the findings in the three papers that are included in the thesis. And I hope that I would, at some stage in the future, see the synopsis uh, wrapped up as a book chapter uh, somewhere. Uh, so there was a, a little extra thing for you to do there. That's okay. Uh, as a non-specialist in birds, I have miss a short section on, uh, uh, on a general overview of the involved species uh, of birds, maybe their population size, their diving patterns, because that's uh, how uh, the risk of getting uh, a collision with the nets, yeah. um, if such data uh, exists, and maybe also when they occur in our waters. Uh, that would have helped a non-specialist uh, in this. Uh, I'll say the synopsis and the first paper are sharp, clear, and to the point uh, really well, uh, where the two manuscripts have uh, small indications that you have not had uh, the same amount of time to lift them to the highest uh, readiness levels. Uh, but it's, uh, I would say, relative small structural things uh, that has uh, no effect on the, on the scientific validity uh, of the papers. Uh, then I have uh, a question. Um, it's about paper two, um, where you have a very extensive data collection uh, and uh, in an area where it's very difficult to build up the numbers of observations uh, of bird uh, bycats and gillnets. Uh, you're lifting your findings up to the highest fleet uh, level possible and entitle the paper. Estimating Seabird Bycats in Danish Commercial Gillnet Fisheries. And the title of your PhD is Bycats of Seabirds in Danish Gillnet Fisheries, Assessing Scale and Testing Mitigation. My, my question is, what, what do you consider fleet level here? The fleet level is, uh, well, in this case, it's all the active uh, Danish gillnetters in this area. Uh, so uh, 3B23 and 3C22. Um, yeah, that, that, that are harbored in, in this area. So, I mean, one of, one of the, yeah, well, the, yeah, the, to answer your question, I, I can say more than that, but uh, yeah, so that's not the, the whole Danish fleet, if it's what you imply. Okay, okay. No, that was maybe what I would expect with the with the title there, as it is in the Danish. Commercial. Yeah, I think I think the title actually is uh, it's it, a better title uh, should should be used in the in the final version of this paper. It's at least a very interesting uh, question of what fleet level is, and uh, also how um, the extrapolation of your study area. Uh, how big can you extrapolate that? Because of course the goal is to see to get an uh, idea of in a larger scale, either in uh, water or in all our waters, uh, what uh, the magnitude of this problem is, so we can do something about it. Uh, to what extent can you extrapolate your findings outside of the study, uh, outside of the study area uh, yeah. and the fishery conducted here? And, and uh, which variables are important to consider in such an exercise? Um, well, with the data that we collected in this area, uh, we assume that the, the 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 vessels we assume many different small things, but they added they 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 added up. We assume that the uh, the bycatch we observed from uh, electronic monitoring vessels was representative of the whole fleet. Therefore, we could use this model and apply it to other vessels where, which we had no, where we had no uh, observers or electronic monitoring equipment, and then we could predict the bycatch that they had. And uh, I'm aware that the, 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 the fraction, the proportion of vessels uh, that we use to, uh, to model the distribution of the fishing effort is only a fraction of the, of the whole fleet. And the fact that they uh, carry uh, such equipment might actually, um, they might actually not be representative, but they may be too, you know, and, 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 the, and this is, I think this is a, a larger question. It's like uh, when, I, when I speak to uh, fisheries observers or people working with fisheries observers data here in Denmark, uh, 
they um, they tell me that, for instance, fishes fishes observers they don't necessarily. Um, uh, I'm losing my uh, my the the right word here, but they don't necessarily choose uh, the vessel that they are going to sample at random. They have a list of vessels that they know will be more. Um, uh, easy to get than others. So it's not absolutely random. So, I mean, these are these assumptions that I hope I've made clear right from the beginning that um, this is, these are the data that we have and we need to extrapolate from this data knowing that there's this uh, level of uncertainty. One, one thing, for instance, uh, that, that is uncertain uh, in, in this paper and this, in this particular area, and I'm talking really on, of inner Danish waters here, is that there are some uh, harbors where there's no vessel that uses AIS. And so it might be that these vessels actually have some sort of a, um, a different fishing patterns. That's one thing. So yeah, it would be, it would be uh, uh, something that we cannot see. And we would extrapolate, and we would extrapolate anyway. And, and the, the second thing I wanted to say is also that I didn't use uh, uh, seabird densities, for instance. And, and 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 it is of course important to consider that uh, we know that seabirds they do, uh, especially in the winter, they do gather in certain areas rather than in other areas. So if we see that there is a, some sort of an overlap. Uh, of fisheries with the expected distribution or densities of the birds, then there's, there's a higher vulnerability risk uh, to, to, to use the words that uh, I think it was Sontag that, that, that used this word. But, uh, so this is also something that I would like to, 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 to incorporate. And now to extrapolate to the whole fleet, because I think that was more or less your question, uh, we know from what we've observed from the uh, electronic monitoring data, data set uh, that uh, the patterns that we see in, say, Skagerrak, where we also have a problem of, uh, of seabird bycatch, or a little bit in the North Sea and in Kattegat, are actually quite different from what we see uh, in, in the Danish waters. For instance, the way they set the nets, uh, there's something typical in Skagerrak is that they do wreck, um, wreck fishing. So they set very short nets around and sometimes even in a circle in some sort of weird patterns uh, around, around the wrecks and it depends on the currents and so on. And so this, with the approach that I used, uh, would need to be, um, to be done in this particular area. And I couldn't just extrapolate the findings from in the Danish waters or the, the, the bycatch rates say. To, to, to this other area because it's actually quite quite different. Hmm. I don't know if that. So you will uh, need some kind of similarity uh, in the fishing operation and the target species and the, the presence of the bird species uh, to be yes. able to extrapolate. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. I will uh, let you uh, take the word, Simon. Okay, thanks. Yeah, <clears throat> we skated over a number of issues which I had questions about, but I'm just focusing in on the on the um, the the question that Ludwig just asked you as well about um, extrapolating out beyond the area that you actually studied. So, I mean, I was looking at the map with the grey area and then the the, the points uh, that you 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 got your AAS data or your and your um, your observations from. Um, and I'm wondering, I mean, you didn't make any comparisons with the seabird distributions, but I know that there are such data available. And I think in your last slide of your presentation, you indicated that you maybe would be looking at that. But I just, so that was going to be my question is, are you going to look at it? Um, but I guess uh, there is a question that you must at least have some idea about what seabird distribution is during the, the, the months of relevance. And have you any reason for believing that there are, for example, concentrations of birds in the areas that you were seeing high bycatch, as opposed to areas um, beyond where you actually sampled, maybe just in the, in the northern margin, for example. Uh, is there any suggestion in your mind that you may have been sampling areas that were either um, higher or lower than a kind of uh, an average um, density of seabirds? Well, one thing is I don't have proof of this because we don't have the data. Uh, but how can I say that? Yes, 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 yes. How, give me a second to collect my thoughts. Um, so there are density maps, not for the Ersun, sadly. Um, which is where, I, at least when I started, I had the most data. Um, 
there are density maps and I really wish that uh, soon enough we'll be able to incorporate this to model actually uh, by catching a, a more uh, accurate way, so to say. Uh, now, I think your, your question was whether I think that basically the, the, the vessels that we sampled would have a higher bycatch uh, rate or uh, risk or bycatch per unit effort than uh, uh, vessels out, all the vessels that, are, that, that, that we didn't observe. Is that? Well, or, or indeed lower. I mean, I just wonder whether or not you, you, you're aware of there being areas of high bird density, either inside or outside the area that you sampled, that might lead you to suggest you may have got a biased sample. Because you, you, you sampled in a relatively small part of the area into which you then extrapolated. So that would be yes. a concern, if you like, that you may have picked an area, that, or two or three areas, that were either higher or lower than, than you might reasonably expect on average. Yes, so um, I, from the conversation that I have with the skippers that we, we've been working with, I, I, I got from them that they tend to fish in areas where they want to minimize, uh, and it's not just the skippers we, we work with, by the way, where they want to minimize bird bycatch. Um, maybe not all of them, but but in general, and that's because having one bird here and there from time to time is not really an issue. It takes time to disentangle, but it's not an issue. Having a lot is actually a problem. Uh, nets, they cost money and, and, and they actually want to avoid that. That is something that at the very least is extremely annoying for a fisherman to catch, uh, to catch many birds. So they tend uh, to fish in areas where they know that birds are not going to be an issue or a pest even if you want in in in, in this uh, in this regard um, and the, the the fishes that we've been working with in general were quite aware of the problem of, of seabirds some of them uh, being uh, being uh, yeah not just aware but wanting to do something about it uh, and so I would uh, consider the data that we collected at least in this area uh, as being conservative because they we they, they, they did pay attention to actually not catch too many birds, uh, which, as I said to some of them sometimes, well, you know, just fish normally, because we need this data. We need, we need, to, need it to be representative. Now, with that said, there are areas uh, where we know from, um, well, not data that we have collected from what people report to us, where they, they, there is a high, uh, much, much higher bycatch rate, especially in some fisheries like the Lumsucker fishery, which I mentioned at the end, but, but not just that. Uh, Dominique, you were just uh, uh, talking about the, the common scotter or scotters in general. Uh, there is an area in northwestern Chile where apparently this problem uh, is big because we know that they uh, gather at sea over there. There's also a fishery uh, that's happening over there and we have literally no data from, from this area. And it could be because uh, simply fishers know about that and they don't want to be annoyed with uh, uh, people who would say, well, you cannot fish here because there, there are birds. I think the, the, the problem also uh, exists for all the protected species, including uh, cetaceans in this case, or small cetaceans. Um, so yes, yeah, there is a risk. Uh, the, the best way I think to address, uh, the, there, there is a risk that our data is not fully representative of the, of the whole fleet. Put the, the meaning that you want around fleet in this case, uh, but, uh, uh, but this is something uh, I wish we can address when we have seabed density maps. And I don't, I don't have, you know, a definite answer right now to tell you whether this is absolutely uh, 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 underestimating or, or, or exaggerating the numbers. But given our sample scheme, I, I would, I'm, let's say I'm, 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 I, I would, my best guess would be that our estimates are, are, are really conservative. That's the best way I can put it. Okay, that's good. Um, if I can just carry on with that, I mean, I had a number of, of uh, um, questions or issues about the whole electronic monitoring system. And I have to confess immediately that I'm not only old, but also old school in the sense that I, I see a lot of benefit in, in using observers um, as well as electronic monitoring. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So I was wondering, um, this issue of bias, uh, to focus on that for a minute. So you, um, you said that uh, quite a lot of the birds were actually caught in a very few hauls. I can't remember what the percentage was, but it was very small. Um, and you were concerned that this might be um, missed if you were to use observers. Sorry, I've got two or three questions going on in my head at the moment. Um, I guess, focusing on one, um, if you put electronic monitoring equipment on just like three boats, you are going to be monitoring, obviously, three boats. And if those boats happen to be boats that fish in areas where there are going to be high bycatch uh, events occurring very rarely, you will pick them up. Um, you may also be missing boats, though, that have got more frequent high bycatch hauls, um, or indeed, um, maybe those are the only three boats in the fleet that are doing that. So uh, to me, it, makes, it would make a lot more sense um, to try and, and spread sampling more widely, to try and sample as many different boats in as many different locations as you are, to try and pick up this fact about whether or not these high bycatch events are, are rare amongst the fleet, uh, or just rare within an individual um, vessel. And Again, to me, the obvious way of doing that is to have observers who've got legs and can move around from one boat to another with uh, fairly rapidly between trips. Whereas if you put the electronic equipment on a boat, it's stuck there. Um, and it, you're just sampling that one boat and it's going back to the same area normally again and again and fishing again and again. So I wonder, um, I don't know how expensive it is to install the equipment and what proportion of the total cost that it is and how difficult it is to move equipment from one boat to another. Clearly, you wouldn't want to be doing that a different boat every trip. Um, and I don't know operationally how, how easy it is to do this or how frequently one might be able to change uh, kit from one boat to another. So I wonder what your thoughts are about that, about whether or not, in a sense, you may be kind of shooting yourself in the foot, as it were, a little bit by uh, sticking to electronic monitoring rather than having mobile observers moving amongst the boats in this question of, of bias. There's a lot to say again. But uh, yeah, that's a very interesting point. Um, well, I'll start to say by uh, I'll start by saying that uh, well, I, I really think that it's complementary. I mean, I, I'm I, by no way I mean that uh, electronic monitor, at least in this particular uh, uh, thing that we're doing here, estimating bycatch of protected species, electronic monitoring does not replace. Uh, fisheries observers, that's for sure. Now, as you pointed out uh, at the end of the question, I think at the end of the day, the problem is really the cost. Um, what I think our data pointed out is that there is a, a, there, there is a problem of, bio let's take the earth, for instance, so the body of water that's just next uh, to Copenhagen here, uh, the, where I, I said there are in our data 40% of the bycatch in the number of seabirds that were captured, uh, that were captured in, uh, in uh, less than 1% of the trips that we observed. Um, well, this is an information that we didn't have before uh, having the electronic equipment on these vessels. And maybe, uh, yes, and maybe, I mean, for sure, uh, these 0.7% uh, to be precise, I should put some sort of uh, uh, confidence interval around this. But even without this, I think it's interesting for the fisheries observers and the fisheries observers program to know this because, um, as I said before, we, we're moving towards uh, 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 more, taking more uh, into account birds and other protected species in, into consideration. I mean, in, in, not so, uh, in the past, not so long ago, uh, fisher, fisheries observers could go on board and literally ignore uh, any any interactions with seabirds, uh, and 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 now there are uh, new uh, sets of um, not of rules but of uh, new procedures that are coming. There's some uh, working groups that have uh, that are putting this in, into place uh, to include that in the data collection framework, the, the European uh, Union way of collecting data at sea. So also that fisheries observer collect this data. But I think that the information we bring, we have brought from the electronic monitoring uh, program, for instance, and not only, of course, there are other ways, uh, just point out that, yeah, there, there is a potential problem here. And the potential problem is that we might miss this. So now, 
yeah, I think I think both should work in in some sort of a, of a connection of some sort of a, um, yeah a dialogue. I mean, here in Denmark, for instance, uh, the the monitoring program that we have, the electronic monitoring program that we have, has been uh, branded almost as a pilot study for many years. And for the first year, now it's moved to another section, which is quite important because it's, it's becoming part of the data collection framework. It's becoming a, a, an official way of collecting data next to the, uh, uh, the, the fisheries observers. Uh, they, they, they're not firing fisheries observers to put uh, cameras on board vessel. And in terms of costs, if you take all the tools at your disposal, and you say, well, I want to study this in the best way. I think uh, one of the big advantage of uh, uh, electronic monitoring is that you can have on some vessels, many would be better, but it costs a lot, uh, on some vessels, a uh, um, uh, uh, long time series of fine scale uh, data, which you don't get with observers because oh, well, you could, but it costs a lot to just uh, put observers on board on almost every trip or every trip. So in this sense, uh, I know that there, have been, there has been some publications that have calculated the relative cost of uh, uh, having the same uh, fraction of the fleet that's being observed with observers or, 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 using, um, or using electronic monitoring to, 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 to do the same sort of a job. Uh, of course, it costs some money to have the equipment installed on board, especially if we, if we work with uh, the camera system that we use, which is relatively big. Um, and then there's, there's the cost of analyzing this data. But in the future, there, there might be, I think for, for seabirds and bycatch in general, it might be a bit premature to say that, but, but for other type of fisheries, there, there, there will be some sort of automati automatization of this process to see, uh, um, uh, to, to, to uh, sorry, identify, for instance, the fishing activity and potential areas. If we know that there are potential areas that are problematic, then we could say, well, uh, we know that these vessels, they, they fish there, so uh, we need we need to uh, to, to watch uh, this 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 portion of the videos. So we might think that in the future, electronic monitoring equipment is going to be cheaper than it is now. Um, I don't think fisheries observers are going to become cheaper in the future though. So, I mean, this is also a balance between these two, but fisheries, I mean, cameras will not be able to measure uh, the length of a fish, for instance, well, some conditions they can, but not on a gillnet vessel, for instance. So we will always need fisheries observers to go on board. Um, and I think, yeah, uh, camera systems can just be a help for them too, to, uh, uh, for instance, to, to collect bycatch data. Yeah, that's good. I mean, in a way, the two, the two, two ways of doing this are co sort of complementary because with the camera systems, you can get very intensive monitoring of a small number of boats and monitor what that boat does or those boats do throughout the year. Whereas, as I said before, I think the nice thing about observers is they can move around. I mean, I think there are other advantages to observers as well, and one of which is keeping in close contact with the, with the fishery. Um, so that you have much more daily yeah, um, conversations with people, you find out a lot more information that way. Um, one of the questions I had about um, from emanating from your presentation uh, was I'm not quite clear how you go about estimating soak time from the videos that you've collected. Um, how do you do that? Oh, well, uh, I need to teach that actually to other people, uh, funny enough. Um, so we it's 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 easy i think you you, you get it it's easy to 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 see uh where the hole happens right you 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 have the uh you you can even just look at the speed of the vessel and and the shape of the of the of the gps trace and and you see where it is and then you pinpoint exactly when the hole starts and stops by watching the video so that that is that is easy uh depending on the vessels that, that, that we have, it's not always easy to see when they set the nets because it, they might set at the back of the boat where we don't have a camera. We can uh, sort of uh, identify this by just looking at the pattern, the speed and what the fisherman does on board, etc. So we can also identify the sets. And then uh, at least with the software that we use, we can uh, overlay uh, different fishing trips 
per day, or the, 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 sorry, the, well, yeah, overlay the, 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 the traces of the, of the different trips. So we can see when there's a GPS trace, say, uh, set that is uh, more or less on the same uh, line than, than, than a whole. So this gives us, uh, it doesn't prove that it's the, 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 same, uh, the, the same net, of course, but this gives us information. So when we have long time series like this, then we have identified the sets, we have identified, identified sorry, the holes, and then we, um, we couple these two, and then, well, the, the, there's some yeah, scripting, extracting information, but yeah, to keep it simple, then we calculate the difference in time between uh, the, the hole and the set, and then we have the amount of time that the net, the net fleet has spent on the water. So you, are you assuming then that they always set and haul from the same end of the fleet of nets? No. Okay. No, because, because they don't. Because exactly, they don't. yeah. That's what confused me, because if they're picking up the, the net, shooting it, leaving it at one end, and then picking it up at the other end, close to where they've previously shot another one, you could easily get confused as to which net was being picked up, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, there's a bit of approximation on this, obviously. But, I mean, we're talking about... Uh, nets that are, it depends on the areas, but several hundred meters, kilometers long. Uh, what, what I call, uh, what the time that we take to calculate the soak time is the, um, the middle, uh, how do you say that again? Uh, it's, it's the, like say uh, you, you, you're going to hold up a net from uh, one o'clock to two o'clock and then the whole time in this case would be 1.30. Same for the sets. And then we take the difference between these two. So we don't check at which end. For some, I mean, actually, like for the majority of the, of the net fleets that we observe, it's relatively easy to find. For some uh, fishing patterns, it can be, well, it can be, it, it can be tricky. So you actually need to have uh, uh, people who analyze these data who are awake. It's actually quite fun, especially when you have, I was talking about uh, uh, wreck fishing, you know, when you have, you have some fishes that they almost draw letters with their nets, you know, and, and you need to find that and, and, find, and, and find, uh, uh, where they are. And in the vast majority of the time, I don't have the numbers, but in the vast majority of the time, we can actually see, uh, the soak time. And if we can't, if we cannot identify, uh, uh, how many hours the net has spent in the water, then it's excluded from the data set in general. You're muted. Yes, sorry, I, I just realized I was muted. Um, uh, okay, well, why don't I, I'll, I'll give the floor back to Dominic now and um, see what he has to ask you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I want to ask about common scooter. Uh, some of some part of these questions uh, you already answered, but uh, maybe we, we can we can uh, tell a little bit more about this species because Danish water is known for the largest wintering number of this species in the Baltic and uh, might be even the largest in the world. Uh, and uh, in your study, you didn't have any uh, any common scooter, but, but I've seen uh, the picture of your presentation, and there was three common scooters. So I assume that that you did have in 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 your bycatch uh, these species, but uh, but for sure they uh, they were less than than, than other species. So uh, did uh, your study were conducted in the area where there is no common scooters or? Perhaps they are less uh, susceptible to bycatch, um, and uh, and uh, do you know about general situation of common scooter in in Denmark uh, over the last 10, 20 years? Uh, do you know uh, the trend of this species, which is uh, decreasing, increasing, or maybe stable? Because if you have uh, the biggest number of wintering uh, species, uh, uh, that 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 is uh, that is uh, where uh, we can we can uh, look for the threat for, for that species. Yeah. Uh, so you had uh, in your first article 
the list of species, and there was uh, Melanita spe. So this obviously applies to two species, common sculptor and velvet sculptor. So, so did you have any any problem with uh, recognizing this species in uh, monitoring when analyzing monitoring uh, data, or, uh, or, or or just put both of these species together? Um. Yeah, sorry. Uh, can, I, I can start answering now if, if you want. For scatters in general, uh, are there problems to 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 see what is what on the on the video footage? Yes. For scatters, yes. Uh, I mean, we're basically talking about a black duck, uh, so it's not always easy. I'm just checking what I wrote in the paper. Okay, yeah, that's just the. Uh, the genus that's written in 3.1%. No, we did uh, identify at species level when we could. And uh, for, 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 but we basically have here velvet scotters and common scotters. Common scotters are, are more frequent. Uh, and, and, and we see them both in bycatch. Uh, and we, we can identify them using some yeah, uh, plumage, the, the mark on, around or next to the eye and on the bill. Among among other things, but sometimes it's just that the video quality is not good enough, you know. So because like say it's uh, very early in the morning in the winter and it's raining, uh, then you you do know that it's a scotter, either a velvet scotter or common scotter, and you cannot identify uh, the species. So that happens too. So there's the three uh, in the database that we have. There's those three cases where even more because we can actually sex them. Uh, but there's the three cases where we have uh, common scotter, velvet scotter and unidentified uh, scatter in this case. Yeah. With that said, um, it seems from what I've heard, yeah, uh, and yeah, that the, the, there are areas uh, that, as you, as you pointed out, where there's a, a, a large aggregations of, uh, of scatters uh, in, in the winter, uh, not just the winter, uh, in, in this case, in Danish waters. Um, and yes, there might be a problem of bycatch in these areas that we're not aware of. And it seems that in some places there is, but we don't have data for that. So yeah, that's one thing. About the status, I must admit uh, that I don't remember the status of the, of the species in Denmark or in the region. I would, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to assume. So maybe you know and, 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 and you can tell me. I'm not, I don't remember whether this is decreasing uh, in the Baltic Sea or not. Um, because generally a common scooter is uh, uh, treated as a least concern. So uh, we can assume that that is going quite well. Yeah. But that scooter is, uh, is vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, recently it's uh, more or less good and, uh, and stable, but it was uh, quite a big decrease in number in between 90s and uh, early 90s and and uh, and early 2000s. So uh, so yeah yeah that that is that is interesting uh, that was interesting for me. What what is the general situation and uh, what is the, the bycatch rate? So so I think that that, that would be a good idea to 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 find some uh, to to find some. Hotspots of uh, occurring uh, uh, places where they congregate in big number, and 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 there is also uh, gillnet fisheries. Uh, so probably that would be a good idea to 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 go in that area to do some monitoring of uh, of these species. But uh, I must ask also about my favorite species, uh, greater scout. Uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> because this is unfortunately in Poland, this is one of the mon most common boycott birds in, in fishing nets. If this is due to the fact that they choose the places where uh, also used by uh, gillnet fishery, and they congregate in very large and dense flocks. So in this uh, causes that in certain circumstances they are exposed to mass uh, uh, mortality. So I just wanted to ask whether did you have uh, any a greater scalp in your bycat and uh, do you know maybe do you have any suspecting that uh, they are any 
potential hotspots where they can be bycatch in, in Danish waters? Um, I, we didn't observe any greater scope in our in our data set. I'm just gonna check and I'm here. Uh, the last uh, the last observations. Did we see any from from our data? I, I don't. I, I mean, I I have checked most of the birds. Uh, not not all lately because I was busy with other things. But I haven't seen uh, any. Now I know uh, from a previous study in who I think it was in south of Fune, where they had. Yeah, I need I need to dig into my literature to 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 find the the, the actual study that I'm thinking of. But there there there, there is at least in in some areas there might be a problem. Yes, of bycatch of greater scope in gillnet fisheries. Um, it's not a smaller report I'm thinking of than a study. But anyways, we haven't seen that in our data. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. But again, this is something that uh, there might be a problem in areas where we are blind, basically. And in this case, I think what's happening is that the greater scope is not uh, present uh, in, in, in the areas where we have the the, the bycatch monitoring. Just to, to come back on the common scotter just for one second, and the scotters in general, but the common scotter in particular, what we've observed, um, or what I have observed, I should say, is that they tend to be caught together with common eiders uh, in the winter, at least. Uh, and so it, it looks like, and from what I've seen too, it looks like at least in some places they do aggregate some individuals together with common eiders, and then maybe they can get a uh, 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 bycott in these conditions. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the 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 last question about about this this situation is partly answered by by you, but uh, uh, I I ask maybe maybe we we can tell Sana a li little bit more about about that because uh, this is very important before conducting the bycatch monitoring to uh, uh, to have to, to designate the hotspots as precisely as possible site where there will be probably the conflict between bird conservation and fishery uh, if we do a good monitoring only in places where for example common either and common glimot uh, occurs uh, but not common scotter scalp we cannot extrapolate it uh, to general water of or of, of the of the region uh, so what do you know about these sites of uh, your your monitoring your study uh, um, were they previously known as a bycatch hotspot and uh, um, uh, have you ha have you thought about other danish uh, danish hotspots uh, if you could tell us uh, uh, where they are and what species are, are um, exposed there. So you you did answer partly for 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 that question, but but maybe you you have some 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 other comments, some other places where where, where there is potential bycatch problem. Yes, um, we have we have uh, generally speaking uh, some ideas of where the bycatch. Uh, rates are probably higher than 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 average. Um, I said I talked already about southern Kattegat, uh, but also some fisheries seem to be um, uh, some 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 type of uh, fisheries targeting a certain uh, target species uh, seem to be associated with higher bycatch rates. Lumsucker fisheries, for instance, mm -hmm. um, and so. Yeah, uh, we have seen from some of the data that uh, is not published yet that yeah, there are there are there are definitely places where the problem is much higher than what is reported here for some species. And there's also there's also uh, areas where it seems that fishermen just don't want to be. Uh, the, the, uh, maybe it's a bit harsh to say it like this, but they they they, they don't want people to put their nose into their. Uh, their uh, into, into what they, what they do because they know that there is a problem i mean and i'm talk we're talking about birds here i'm pretty sure that simon uh, you know about uh, the problems we can have with harbor porpoise uh, where there are areas uh, where maybe the, the bycatch rates are higher 
and it's really hard to uh, to send people to or to, so to put cameras or to send people on board for that matter to actually know what's going on and when we can it's not always exactly what they usually do because you know there's what you know as the observer's effect um i like I think, yeah, I think I'm pretty sure I know that I put that in the, in, in the thesis, uh, the approach that, um, that Sontag used in, in Germany a few years back where they, uh, where they looked at um, the, well, the different things, but they basically uh, 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 defined the, the gillnet fishing effort on the German coast and also uh, the, 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 they, they had uh, density maps for, for seabirds and then they, they, they looked at uh, the uh, overlay, if you want, between these two, and then they created this vulnerability index. So that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's. Uh, I mean, if one wants to some sort of maybe not predict bycatch uh, hotspots, uh, but but uh, get an idea where the problem could be, I think this is interesting. Uh, such an approach. I know that uh, Lotte Kind here uh, in Denmark she did something. Uh, a little bit similar with Harbor Porpoise, where they had density maps based on uh, uh, on uh, animals that were tagged, so they knew where they were going, uh, in which season, and so on. Uh, there was also data from electronic monitoring and um, and and also bycatch data, bycatch rates, and so they could estimate um, uh, bycatch hotspots using uh, this this type of approach. So there's different, uh, yeah, there's there's different ways of doing, but I mean. As always, the problem is where do you start? Uh, wh where do you start when you have no prior information? I guess, uh, and that's that's a very difficult question. I think I, I actually don't think there's an answer to that. We need to start somewhere to collect data and then build upon this. I guess. That's right. That's right. But this is this is a good idea to overlap. Uh, the density map of uh, birds occurring and uh, fishing effort, and then you have uh, you have hotspots. And uh, even if fishermen don't want to have uh, observer on the board or or uh, electronic monitoring system, you can say them. This is this is the place of hotspots, and uh, and uh, we can even estimate how many birds can 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 be bike up here. And uh, uh, and yeah, this is this is the way for choosing the place for better monitoring. Okay, thank you. Maybe I pass for Ludwig. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to go a little bit back to uh, where Simon. Uh, this is Simon's question in the electronic uh, monitoring. You. Um, uh, based on uh, electronic monitoring and uh, AIS data, you reconstruct the fisherman's activity or operational pattern uh, at sea and calibrated that uh, while using the video, which is a quite nice uh, approach. Um, and then you, of course, extrapolated that outside so you have, uh, don't have to look through all the videos. You have relatively few fishermen involved. Did you confront them with uh, your reconstruction of their operational patterns or ask them whether that made sense or were they involved in that process? No, I did not. And that's actually an excellent idea. Yeah, I should do that, definitely. No, I did not. I, I, to, to be frank, I didn't even think about doing that, but I should, yeah, yeah. That's, that's definitely uh, a good idea. Yes. And often fishermen, they, have, uh, they keep uh, in their plotters where they have put their nets uh, and you can actually go in on the plotter line to see time and all these things. So there's a lot of data that is uh, available there. Uh, that maybe could uh, help or uh, validate. Uh, yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. More work on the desk, I guess. But yes, that that's true. I mean, I think I said that already, but I'm going to say it again. You know, the representativity of the data is one of the biggest issue we can have here. Is our data representative or not? And if it's not, how not representative is it? Uh, Yes. You just have to remember this, where do we come from? We come from nothing. So it is uh, exactly. steps uh, exactly, yeah. the right way. That's the important part of this. Then, then one more short thing about the electronic monitoring. Uh, it's the labor uh, of looking through this that is the costly process. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll have a room or uh, two rooms sitting with students doing that in the future? In five years, ten years? 
Uh, do I think that we will have that? Actually, do yes. That, okay. Uh, so you but, don't think uh, that techniques like uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence can go I in? Was, the... I was to say that, yes, but it will definitely be helped with uh, AI. Um, I mean, it, it, one, uh, Simon was pointing out, you know, looking at this, uh, uh, how do you get soak time? It's tedious to get soak time uh, because you need to, you know, go into these picky nitty details and machine learning processes. I mean, since I started my PhD, they've, they've evolved so fast. So I was showing uh, Stefan, I know it's a bit of a parenthesis, but it's interesting. I was showing Stefan an app that's called Seek uh, on, the, on the phone and that does that. You have a camera and you point at any living thing, object, whatever, even a leaf or a tree. And it, uh, it gives you, uh, it identifies what it is. It, it gives you what it is at, at down to species level. And it's extremely impressive to see that it just works on a mobile phone. It, you can download it for free. Um, and yes, there's definitely going to be, uh, in, this part is evolving extremely fast. Uh, uh, here at uh, Aqua, we had the Aqua, we have people that have started working on this. And I really hope that in five years, let's say five years, but I don't want to be too optimistic or pessimistic, I don't know, uh, we will have something that can, uh, that can help uh, analysts. Now, especially for uh, gillnet fisheries, uh, the quality of the video data and even the angle uh, that we watch can be very different. The net haulers, they can be moved a little bit. So what you actually see on the picture varies. And uh, I know that artificial intelligence has the word intelligence in it, uh, but this is basically a, a training process. So it's really good at, um, at doing tons of stuff. I mean, I'm not a specialist of this, but at seeing patterns, at seeing the same thing and identifying extremely quick. But when things change and are more subtle, uh, as to now, at least, we're still definitely the best. So uh, I think data analysts in this sense, they might, uh, you know, we can remove a lot of the tedious work and I hope we will, because I mean, that's, that would be really nice for them too. And so they can concentrate on actually what we're good at to, to well, identify a bird, but also to see, you know, stuff that, that, that don't work. Uh, I have several examples where we needed to look into what was going on because, you know, there was just, uh, the, the, there was a storm that, ha that had come a few days before and the, fisher, uh, the, 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 the fishermen were actually collecting pieces of net in which there were birds. And we wanted to, well, you know, sort of associate this to um, which net it was at the beginning, because it was also interesting to have information of what happens after a storm. And it was difficult, it took time, but it was also uh, uh, something that, that, that was some almost enjoyable doing. It was not tedious in this case, it was a bit challenging. And that's not something that is easy to teach a machine, um, I think, because there's not just not enough data for that. Uh, but yeah, we're collecting more and more data. I know that uh, also Anchor Lab, so we use uh, 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 an electronic monitoring system from, from this company, uh, is also developing its own uh, way of uh, automatizing some of the tasks, especially for maybe uh, uh, trawlers, you know, when there's a conveyor belt uh, and, and, and so on to watch fish. Um, but yeah, it will, it, it will come. And we will still need human beings. Yeah, yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, this with soak time is uh, interesting. My clever colleague Esther is using these small star audits that integrate them into the nets and then to, yeah. to, to, to see how much the nets are used. And I guess that could be done for a week or two to see the precision and accuracy in your estimation of the soak time, maybe. Uh, just an idea. Um, you have also uh, made a very interesting paper with the um, uh, bycatch mitigation using acoustic and uh, visual things. Uh, this is the early start, I guess, of uh, trying to see what we can do with this. We have had the exact same issues and trials in uh, fisheries where we more or less, I would say, uh, pick uh, off the shelf things in uh, with lights, see what kind of reaction we get out of it. And uh, sometimes we get a significant reduction uh, or uh, sometimes we don't get anything. The, the, the problem is afterwards. Uh, what do we do next? Because it's a, it's a trial and run uh, or trial and error um, yeah. thing. Uh, this, and it really needs a more mechanistic understanding of uh, the animal's reaction to, uh, 
to lights and there's so much different light uh, and all these uh, things. Um, so I, I want to ask you, how, how realistic do you think we get some uh, kind of deterrent in nets? The nets are cheap. Uh, small boats can operate, as you said, several kilometers of this. So there's a lot of, it needs to cover uh, a, a very large area. So how realistic do you think that will be? Uh, it will it be uh, this be a technological solution, or will it more be moving to alternative uh, gears or uh, simply to regulation? Uh, um, um, well, again, that depends. That depends. I mean, um, the only way we can suppress bycatch in gill nets is by suppressing gill nets. That's makes it, that makes it pretty easy. I mean, this is the solution. We have it already. Um, so, and that could be done by legislating, saying, well, this area, the, 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 you know, that there is a species in this area that's, uh, that we want to, uh, to, 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 to save, to conserve, and then uh, it's forbidden to fish, period. It's a, a, a marine protected area, for instance, a no-take marine protected area. Um, so these bycatch device, these bycatch reduction devices that we test, is also to to allow fishers to 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 keep to keep fishing. Now, in the future, should they keep fishing with gillnets? Is another question. There are areas uh, where uh, some gillnets are already switching to other gears for maybe other reasons, because you know there's depredation from seals, for instance. Uh, they, they, there might be other reasons, and I think that in general, it's 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 some sort of it's. It, it's kind of case dependent. I mean, again, if we see that uh, bycatch uh, uh, levels that we see here in Danish waters, uh, in some areas, if, if we see in the future that they're actually not, well, then we need to define that, but they're not harmful uh, for, for the seabird populations that, 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 that we see by cut, I would say, well, you know, this is this is this is not nice to catch birds, of course. So you, maybe we need to have a deterrent that can avoid this. Uh, but 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 maybe it's not it's not such a big deal. In other areas, uh, uh, we might want to keep uh, the fishermen existing because, well, you know, they, they they need to make a livelihood. We want to keep the fishing, the small fishing communities where they are, because it's important for. All the reasons that you can imagine and in this case we need to find alternative solutions so whether it is switching to other gears which sometimes is difficult uh, for just so, so, uh, sociological reasons uh, even sometimes or is it to find uh, bycatch reduction devices that work I think we need to do both basically and I think we need to do both and in some cases we will need to close uh, uh, fisheries at least uh, part of the year if we want to, 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 to avoid bycatch and to protect species that might be endangered. Uh, you know, Dominic was talking about the greater scope uh, in, in, the, in the lagoons in Poland. I don't know uh, what will happen in the future uh, in, in Poland in this area, but it seems from what I understand of this paper that if we continue doing what we do today, business as usual, then it, it's more than likely that we won't see these birds around for, for, for long in 30 years or so. So we need to act on this. And it is easier to, to close fisheries. Uh, and yeah, then I, I think agree, it's worth I also agree that it's, uh, that's why your, the work that you are doing is important because uh, the first step here is to get a, a spatio temporal understanding of the birds, of the bycats and the fisheries, and then simply take it from there, see what the solutions are, I would guess. Yeah. Also, I'll just, Ludwig, I'll just add one point, so I, I, I forgot to, to mention this, but there are people uh, that have started working on, uh, especially for the long tail duck, in this case, on uh, how it reacts to different uh, 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 visual cues, uh, different uh, uh, wavelengths, and so on, to, to see, you know, if there's room for this, uh, for improvement of what we've already tested. It seems that for this species, at least, uh, it's not really, it's not really a, a, a good, a good alley to to go through. But um, I think it's worth testing for 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 other species or the group uh, of birds of seabirds that have different uh, type of raging behavior. And when it comes to lights, for instance, it has proved proved efficient at reducing bycatch uh, in different groups of animals. So 
turtles for uh, some iconic ones and some seabirds too and also some 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 other some other groups uh, in in south america so it is worth testing uh, now what we've seen because yeah we have had what we've had uh, is that we cannot prove that it's efficient or not in in our waters i think it's worth testing just to prove or disprove that it works and then maybe yeah, go from 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 here and, and and improve what we have or go uh, and and do something else i agree it's definitely worth uh, testing to see what kind of response level you get the problem is uh, optimizing from that and then you are especially yeah. challenged uh, with the low numbers of population you get with this uh, incidental bypass so yeah, okay. yeah. it's a difficult task i will simply uh, give the word back to simon Thanks. Um, yeah, just to sort of follow up on that. Um, I mean, you were talking there about um, further work with lights with respect to which species or to species in general? Uh, with respect, well, I should say with species in general, but the one I have in mind in particular is the common guillemot and razor okay. bill. To make yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that struck me was that, um, as with most of these experiments, you always wish at the end of the day that you'd done more sampling and you could have had a, a bigger sample size in order to be able to demonstrate something. But have you done any sort of power analysis to figure out how much sampling you would really need to do in order to be able to uh, determine um, a difference or, or, or an effect of a given scale? I don't know what that given scale would be. That would depend on what your management goal is or your conservation goal is, I suppose. But have you done any of that kind of work? Have you got any idea about what it would cost in terms of time to do that? Uh, well, no, I have not. Uh, I have not. This is actually something I've, uh, I've, I've, uh, I've talked together with uh, Tiago, who uh, works with Ludwig in your cells, uh, because he's done some power analysis uh, during his PhD, his PhD thesis, and he's done some very interesting work. So yes, this is uh, something that I plan to do in the future for what is coming, because that is something that I didn't do. Uh, well, I have... Yeah, I don't know if it's a good reason or if it's not, but when these experiments started, I also happened to have a, a little boy that came into my life. So I guess uh, that also took my focus away from uh, these details at this point. So I, I, it's not an excuse, but I mean, it's just, it could or at least explain why uh, it's not been done before the experiment, which it should have. I agree. Yes. Yeah, and, yeah. and it will be <laughs> for the next one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that'll be interesting to follow that up. Um, and a, a, a follow-on question from that as well. I mean, let's assume for a moment that um, you know gillnets, uh, sorry, um, lights on gillnets are effective to some extent. Uh, um, have you done any kind of ballpark ideas about what it would actually cost, and it, it, would it be economic for a, a gillnet fisherman? And gillnet, you know, it's a relatively low-cost fishery, and the margins are generally very small. Um, would it be feasible? Um, given what you know about the price of these things, to put them on nets and expect fishermen to pay that and still make a profit from, from what they were catching. Have you got any ballpark ideas about that? Mm, well, not the latest testament. I have that in my emails, the cost of an individual. Um, uh, well, they're not cheap, I don't think. It's not like, you know, uh, two euros. Catch. It's... it's uh, one of the reasons why we, we, we've been working with, for example, uh, uh, fish tech in, uh, in the UK is that, they, that this is a commercial product that they have on the shelf. And it was interesting for us to have something that they have developed. I mean, they actually have developed that with the cost in mind, because as, as they said themselves, uh, it, if it's too expensive, they just won't use it. Uh, so I do not remember the cost of it. One of the problems that we have, uh, and that's very uh, general, um, but say that uh, marine turtles or bycatch reduction device uh, for marine turtles don't have, is that uh, here we, especially in the Baltic Sea, we have a problem of water transparency. So if we want to use lights as a, as a deterring device or whatever that, 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 could, that could be for, for, for the birds. Uh, we need to, it's, it's easier and less costly to, to use it in, in more transparent waters, which is the case in, in Kattegat, Skyrack, but mm -hmm. definitely not in the Baltic where there's a lot of eutrophication. So again, depending on the place, the cost, the, the cost for the fishermen is going to be different because obviously if you cannot see more than uh, two meters or five meters or, or, or seven or more, ahead of you, then you will need uh, accordingly more lights. 
or less lights on the net. Uh, yes, uh, yes. For the for the for the cost estimate, I think this is something that is uh, I'll, I'll keep in mind uh, for this next experiment that's coming. Because as I said, what we're testing in the in this experiment that's coming is a commercial uh, uh, device or something that's commercialized already. So we could definitely uh, include this in the in the results. I think it would be interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, you 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 um you speculate quite a lot in the thesis as well about diving birds and how they may or may not perceive uh, flashing lights or continuous lights, and I guess you have thought about this, but I'm wondering what kind of experiments you think might be done to try and address that from the kind of mechanistic point of view that uh, Ludwig was was mentioning. Um, do you have, have clear ideas about where you might want to go with that? And just as an extension to that, I mean, if, if you had all the money in the world, what kind of uh, further trials would you would you want to do to try and take these mitigation uh, trials further forward? Uh, I'll start with the money question. <laughs> um, well, if we could, I think one thing uh, that would help would be, well, that would help for sure, it would be to understand what the birds perceive in the water. And there's been a, a, a body of work that's been done on some species, uh, some penguins. Uh, I talked about the Gentoo penguin in the, in, in the presentation and, and great common, and also common guillemot on, uh, and also sea ducks on captive birds. And then um, um, to make them, to train them and, 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 and measure their reaction to different kind of uh, either acoustic or, or visual cues. And, Again, on the top of my head, I cannot find uh, her name, but there's been uh, there's been some tests on, or there's been a, a manuscript published uh, earlier this year, um, giving the results of um, how the long-tailed ducks react to different visual stimuli, uh, and and that's something. Yeah, I, I would like to to see done with common guillemot. So. Uh, controlled environment, swimming pool basically, uh, where we test different type of, uh, of wave wavelengths and we train the, the bird to uh, uh, react or to, to um, sorry, to act in one way or another uh, through, well, uh, behavioral studies are a bit, uh, are a bit complex. So I'm not going to, to try to elaborate a, a study just uh, out of the blue here, but there are, there are people who, who work mm -hmm. with this and who are definitely uh, would definitely be, be good at that and uh, so with that said I think it's not that I think I, I know it is important to have this information prior to to trying new things because as Ludwig was pointing out what we've been doing is pretty opportunistic we have this uh, device we're going to test it in this fishery where we know that uh, uh, a fisherman is uh, willing to collaborate if it yeah. works, you everybody's happy and you yeah. pretend that you know it all along. <laughs> but it's very hit and miss, isn't it? I mean, it may be that you've just got the flashes going just slightly too fast or slightly too slow, and you, exactly. you won't know that without doing some kind of uh, exactly. behavioral trials. Yes, that's yes, right. Exactly. Um, well, there are at least indications that these flashing white lights uh, may work, and I think it's worth investigating. Uh, and I mean, personally, I really hope that it works, obviously. Uh, I also know, uh, as I said, that some species like the long-tailed ducks, uh, from previous experiments, they seem to be attracted to these mm -hmm. flashes, or, or, or maybe it's not the flashes, maybe 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 it's something else. But at least there is a higher bycatch when when these nets uh, when these lights were on. So, yeah, it depends on the place, on the on the species, and it needs to be adapted to the to the local situations once to the local situation once again. Yes. Um, how are we doing for time, Stefan? He's playing video. There is, there is actually plenty of time left. We have, we have uh, half an hour to go. Okay. Um, I've kind of um, a number of little questions which go back, picking up some of the things that we've already discussed, which I could, uh, I'll start you on one of them, which was in the pinger trials that you did. Um, I wasn't quite clear about how close the nets were with the pingers on um, compared with the nets that were the control nets. You said you put them in the same place, but clearly if you have them right in the same place, then you have a confounding effect of the pingers on the, on the control nets. How did you manage to set that experiment up so that you were happy that it worked properly? Uh, well, we, 
as I said, we have 41 valid pairs. There's some uh, nets that were too close to each other, that were, uh, some pairs, sorry, that were too close to each other. As far as I remember, and I hope I'm not wrong, uh, there was a minimum distance of 200 meters between uh, control and the experimental net. And uh, it, it, was, it was sometimes more, uh, it was the same uh, sediment they were, uh, they were set on. It was the same depth. They were, they were set on a, on a, at the same depth all along. Uh, to the best of the ability of the of, of the fishermen, it was during commercial. Um, I mean, he, he was a commercial fisherman. He was he was catching uh, the, the this fish and selling his catch. So it was also his way of doing. Uh, I would like to say naturally. So that's actually the way he set the net in gen the, the the net fleets in general. At the minimum distance that we uh, agreed. And I, 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 I'm sorry, but I need to check. But I think it was 200 meters, which I'm aware is a bit. I mean, do you remember how you you came to that number of 200 meters? Was that just expedient because that's what the fishermen were doing, or did you do some kind of assessment of what no, the sand pressure levels would be at different distances? Yeah, there is that. Yes, uh, there is. Um, oh, I don't remember this reference and these curves uh, mm -hmm. where you can calculate the sound attenuation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, we, that's, did, that's what you used. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what we used. Yes, and then the the background uh, noise uh, in in the area, and then we calculated uh, how how far how far away from uh, from from the net you would have to be if you were a cormorant to hear it underwater, based on what we know of the hearing of the cormorant, which mm -hmm. is a bird that hears relatively well, it seems, uh, mm -hmm. the water compared to other 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 species. Um, because that's the information that we had uh, psychoacoustic uh, a measurement for for great common and it hasn't been done for many species Sammy, so we couldn't we can check for mm. but, and were the catches in the control nets they're roughly what you would have expected or did you actually do any comparisons with with um, previously hauled nets in the same area so that you weren't excluding birds from the control nets you knew you weren't doing that rather i mean did, did you look at that at all or is that too um too difficult uh, well i'm not i'm not sure i understood the question okay uh, so if you've got two nets that are 200 meters apart one has got pingers on and the other doesn't the, the one that doesn't is your control net um you would hope that the control net will continue to catch birds at the same rate as if there were no pingers you know in the sea at all that it would carry on catching them um as it has done as it had done previously. But of course, if the pingers are actually affecting the control net in any way, then you may well see um, a reduction, possibly even an increase uh, in, in, the, in the bird bycatch in the control nets. So I'm just wondering if you had enough power to be able to detect that, to see that your control nets were behaving as you would have expected them to. Well, uh, this is not reported in the, in, in the data that we have, but I believe that this was right because the the fisherman was setting at least four net, four net fleets a day uh, during this whole campaign, uh, during this whole uh, sampling uh, that that we had, and we also uh, or I also compared with this so sort of controls out of, out of they were not real controls uh, whether the, the the bycatch rates were similar between specifically the control nets and the other nets that were set in the same area at the same okay. time. Right. Uh, right. So, I mean, this is not uh, something I reported. Uh, mm -hmm. There was no red flag. That's, that's what I can say. Okay. Uh, yeah. It was similar. Yeah. Sometimes they were catching more, sometimes they were catching less, yeah. but on yeah. average, it was, it was definitely the same. Yeah. Okay. That's, I guess, exactly what I was asking or, or hoping that you'd, you'd been able to do. Okay. Um, if I can go back a bit, if I can find my notes. Um, yeah, back to the, uh, the estimation of bycatch. Um, one of the problems that you succinctly pointed out was that if you're um, trying to estimate bycatch for the whole fleet based on observations or sampled vessels, um, you can only, you say, use the, the metrics that are measured in the sample fleet um, that are also available in the whole fleet, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So you in need to have 
You mean or? Yeah, from when I say the whole fleet, I mean from the logbooks, yes. Okay. So, um, for example, uh, mesh size is not necessarily available in the logbook data. So if you're measuring mesh size on your sampled boat, you might not have that in the fleet. So one of the ways that we've tried to overcome that, and I'd be interested to hear what you think, um, is using the, um, the recorded catch in terms of the species yeah. composition to make inferences about the type of net. Yeah. Um, so therefore, for example, if you look at the logbooks and you find that a boat is mostly landing turbot, you know, likelihood is it's using mesh size of over 200 millimeters. Um, similarly, you can do the same thing with soak time and indeed sometimes to some extent with net length. So if you're able to use the observations to validate some of those inferences, I think you can make quite good inferences about what a logbook recorded trip actually represents um, for some of those important metrics. So have you tried to do that? Do you think that might work? Do you think it would be a wrong way to proceed? What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely something I've looked into. Um, where should I start? Well, first, uh, from the electronic monitoring data, we don't have mesh size. We don't. Uh, I mean, yeah. we could we could look the we could look at the logbooks, uh, of course, and then compare the logbooks to what we what, what we observe. But what we've done instead is uh, we um, estimate the catch of each hole, the, the catch uh, of the target species in each hole, and then we can also sometimes see. But and then we uh, we infer which um, uh, especially which um, sorry mesh what what the mesh size is would be given given the catch. So we know that, uh, well, I mean, if, if we were to see a herring, it's small, it, it would be small mesh. Uh, if we would see a lamb sucker or turboat, we know that it's large mesh, large meshes. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, there's uh, everything in between for flatfish and for cuts, uh, which is, mm -hmm. yeah, basically what we catch in the area. Mm -hmm. um, most in in the areas that in the in the yeah the study areas that you've seen most of the the uh, most of the fishing trips that we observed they were uh, targeting flatfish and or cod or cod first actually and, and flatfish and sometimes switching uh, seasonally to mackerel and lump sucker uh, and so that we have and we and we've categorized this and then when we um, sort of uh, merge the data together with the logbook data uh, we also uh, well, the way I did it, at least, is that I took the uh, I took the, the sales notes, so the landings, uh, and so which uh, species was the the uh, which were the species that were above uh, a, a certain number of kilos, which was the species that 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 had the most landing in general. It was there was cards and 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 uh, and place sometimes. Uh, not the flatfish, I can't remember the name of, I'm sorry, uh, in this area at least, uh, and, and seasonally, again, lamb sucker and, and, uh, and, and, and turbot and, and other species. Mm -hmm. So we did infer a mesh size from that. Also in logbooks, sometimes you do have the mesh size that's mm -hmm. indicated. So we have, actually, we have actually in the database uh, a, a column that is called a mesh from logbook and, okay. and, and, and inferred mesh because a lot of time it's actually just... Uh, uh, it's actually just not indicated. You have the landings, but you don't have the mesh size. So we, yeah. we, we did that, and um, that is actually uh, used to feed the 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 sorry the the yeah the bycatch uh, the bycatch model uh, and and yes. Now I think your 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 question was maybe more about validating and maybe also extrapolating because mm -hmm. what what I was thinking. Uh, doing at the beginning which i uh, yeah I, I, I couldn't find how to do it but it would, would be to to see if there are areas where uh, uh at certain time of the years uh, of the year they might fish differently based on these landings mm -hmm. and i did some exploration of this uh spent some hours actually on that and i couldn't find anything so then mm -hmm. I mean, at some point i had to again to move on so 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 i let that go but it doesn't mean that it's not a good approach in other areas and i think that for instance again if you look at skyrack where you have uh depending on uh, 
where you fish and how you fish. You have different species that you that you can capture with gill nets. I think it would be also interesting, and also in the North Sea, I think it would be it will be interesting to uh, to use some 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 similar thing. There's a lot of information that are hidden in logbooks. Yes. News uh, definitely. That that requires some digging. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. There's a lot of digging to be done, but as you say, I think there's a lot of information hidden in there that one can um, sift through and and try and make useful inferences. Um, there was another question that I have for you about the the differences in the bycatch estimates uh, that you had between the bootstrap estimates and the model-based estimates. I mean, the model-based estimates were essentially more or less the same as if you had excluded all of the high bycatch hauls. So for example, I think you had a yeah. 0.24 birds per trip uh, from the model-based estimates and 0.21 um, if you leave out the, the high bycatch um, net hauls. Yeah. And I really wasn't clear, given especially as you'd managed to reduce the confidence intervals on the bycatch estimates in the model-based estimates, how that arrived. And uh, it, it wasn't clear from what I was reading. And I wonder if you've got any idea about why you were getting... Them. Was it something to do with the, the distribution that you were... Um, using in in the model uh, that you were just not picking up or it wasn't predicting anything um uh any large scale catches in, in nets what have you got any feeling for why those two um results were so different um yes uh quickly answer i'm not sure uh, but i'll try to answer anyways uh, the distribution that we use in a bycatch model is a uh, negative binomial distribution. We also tested a poisson for the record. Uh, and clearly the negative binomial was better and it, it, um, uh, it, 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 it's better because uh, yeah, uh, the mean and variance are, are, are not the same. So, so basically it's better at, uh, at um, uh, taking care of, uh, sorry, to, to trying to, to find the right words, but to uh, when, when the data is very um, oh sorry, it's been a few hours. Uh, it's very yes. uh, <laughs> I know, sorry. I wait till the end to ask you this. <laughs> yeah, you should have started with this. <laughs> uh, yeah, when when there is a a, a high over dispersion, which is yes. the case in our data, so we have a very few uh, bycatch events. Or very few trips where there's a lot of it, so uh, a high over dispersion. Then, the, then, 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 I mean, uh, negative binomial models are definitely better at picking up this. Mm. But even if they're good and as good as they are, they're not perfect. And I think, I mean, I've been thinking uh, based on what other people have been doing that maybe another approach that we could use would be to use a. Um, oh wow. Um, and I'm sorry, I cannot find the name of this model, but I explain what it does. You have two models, a binomial model, basically, that says uh, yeah. either there is a bycatch or not, and another it's one. A, that, a hurdle model. A hurdle, thank you. Yeah. So yeah. Th th these kind of models maybe would be better at- Yeah, at that's exactly what I was thinking, yeah. And I, to be honest, I cannot tell you why I haven't used a hurdle. I, I, I don't know, I cannot answer this. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I should have. I know well, that I'm, it's, it's, it's a process of evolution, isn't it? You try one thing, it doesn't work. You have to move on to the next, but at some point you need to stop. Uh, so maybe that's something to be explored in the future. I mean, I think that we have exactly the same problem that we have, whether it's porpoises, seals, or seabirds. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you do hundreds of observations and everything looks as if it's following a certain distribution. And then suddenly you hit an area where you've got loads and loads of animals, one form or another. Yeah. And trying to incorporate that into a model is, is not straightforward. Um, but I think a hurdle model approach might be a good one. Um, I'm kind of running out of questions and of steam as well. Uh, I don't know, do either of my colleagues have other questions that they would like to ask? Hey, maybe because we are, yeah, as you said, running a little bit. Uh, so uh, maybe I ask the last question about uh, mitigation technique, what I, what I was thinking. Uh, you write uh, somewhere in your thesis that fishermen of monitored vessels uh, 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 can consciously choose uh, places where bycatch is smaller. Uh, generally, fishermen know their work well and uh, they are aware 
that if they report large bycatch, they will be afraid of consequences of ban of fishing. Therefore, reporting large bycatch of birds is not in the interest of fishermen. In the absence of monitoring, the fishermen does not have to be afraid of such consequences. So they do not pay so close attention to whether they fish with the risk of bycatch or not. So what do you think that bycatch monitoring itself could be some kind of mitigation measure? Obviously, th that would be difficult to, oh. uh, to, uh, to compare because if you don't have monitoring, you don't, you don't, want, you don't know what, what is the, the rate of bycatch. But I think, I suspect that could be something in that. Well, that's a very interesting point, actually. Yes, it could be. I mean, um, we know about this uh, observer's effect, right? So an observer could be not an observer, but someone being on board will uh, uh, affect the so-called normal behavior of a fisher or the fishing activity. Um, so the, which basically means that they're going to change the way they normally uh, fish. So it becomes non-representative. Uh, and of course, yeah, we have that question uh, with, with uh, electronic monitoring. Um, yeah, I tend, I tend to think that uh, because of that and all the things, but because of that, the, the, the estimates that we, because of what you said about the fact that uh, maybe fishermen who don't care about, uh, about uh, catching birds or not, uh, they just refuse to, to be monitored. And then we only watch the ones that actually care about this. So therefore, if this is true, and I think there's at least, part, it, it is partly true at the very least. Uh, and if it, if it is true, then the, the estimates that we have are definitely conservative. Uh, so this is a base we can work upon and, and, and at least uh, put that at a claim that this is, there is a high certainty that these, this is the minimum number, say of birds that we catch uh, in these conditions, knowing this. Uh, now, another thing is that I know that fishing with gill nets or nets in general are relatively cheap uh, fishing equipment compared to, say, trolls or other type of uh, fishing gears, but they still have a cost and changing them regularly will be expensive. And having a lot of birds or marine mammals uh, uh, on a regular basis will just uh, make them be worn down in, 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 a, in a short amount of time. So I also think that fishes might, hey, I mean, there's again, a, it depends. I mean, it's a cost benefit, basically question. In some fisheries, I don't know if I'm allowed to say. In some fisheries, it seems that uh, they don't care. It does. Because the, the, the money they get from the target species that they catch definitely covers the, the, the broken nets. And they can just throw them. And we have some data to back this up. But uh, yeah, it's not published. So. Uh, on the other hand, for many maybe regular fishermen who catch uh, cards in place, at least in our waters, and, and maybe, I don't know, the species in the lagoons, I mean, maybe the, 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 the money that they make out of these catch is, is not uh, big enough to, uh, to just uh, change their nets every couple of months. Um, yeah. But but yeah, sorry. But and maybe maybe I'm a, I'm a bit uh, sidetracking here. To to answer your question, yes, I think that having more monitoring might definitely be a way to mitigate bycatch in, in this case because it's it's some sort of the you know the police uh, the, the the policeman on the side of the road who has this uh, speed speed uh, speed light. You know, you don't want to. That's be right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is the, uh, obviously difficult difficult to test but uh, if uh, it's work and if it's if is it like that that that, that would be also uh, the solution to uh, have some fake uh, electronic monitoring and uh, they are obviously cheaper and uh, we can put them to nearly all fleet and that that that, that and fishermen don't know which one is fake, which one is the uh, right one. That could that, that could probably work. So, 
Um, that, that could, I mean, I, I actually don't know about that. I think it's very case specific. It depends on uh, uh, the culture in, 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 the, in, in, in the place where we are. Uh, I would say that in general, when it comes to cameras, at least they have a relatively bad press among many fishermen. So yeah, imposing this to every one of them would be uh, quite a task. And and I mean yes, they are maybe cheaper than uh, than than uh, making uh, than sorry putting a, a, a fisheries observer on board uh, at at all time, but they, they still have a cost that that is not negligible. So yeah, uh, I know that in some uh, in some uh, fisheries in not the only fisheries necessarily, but in some fisheries in the U.S. Uh, there is a 100% uh, observer's coverage and they can choose whether they want to have an observer on board or they want to have electronic monitoring on board and all the fishing activity is being, uh, is being watched. And maybe, maybe it has been done in these fisheries uh, that, uh, that they sort of compare the, the behavior or the, or the, or the bycatch uh, rates uh, before and after this was implemented. I'm not. I'm not aware of this, but maybe it exists. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I could uh, give uh, another questions, and so we could speak uh, for for a longer time. That is pity that that, that we couldn't come to you and then go to the yeah, and continue this the, the discussion with the beer that would be very nice but maybe somewhere maybe maybe next time but yeah that was that was good uh, to, 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 to to be here and uh, to, uh, to see your presentation and you know this thanks but also, I think you're 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 also a member of uh, uh, the the working group Bird, right? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. J J W J W G uh, Bird uh, working for Helcom, Ospar, and uh, yeah. ICS. Yes. Yeah, so maybe so. maybe we'll get to meet in person at uh, one of the working groups one day. That'd be uh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I'd be. <laughs> I'll just give you one last question. On the yeah, I'll ahead. continue Simon's uh, modeling discussions, um, but um, just to make sure that your friends and colleagues that have taken the bus to Lyngby, they don't, they think they get something for the bus tickets. Um, and also because I really like to hear your uh, opinion on this, because you're the specialist in bycats of uh, birds now. Bycats of birds and marine mammals uh, have a growing societal and political interest. There's more and more data coming in, which is good. We understand the magnitude and the problems of these things more and more. And we can see that this is challenging coastal fisheries, small scale fisheries that we, or the politicians more or less with the other hand, try to encourage uh, to exist. Um, because it's low impact and uh, for social economical uh, purposes, um, you could argue that trawling could solve this. Daily sailing could solve this. Active fishing gears could solve this. Uh, where, where do you see these things are going? Uh, is these bycatch issues uh, threatening the sustainable coastal fisheries, uh, either pushing it towards an extinction or towards uh, active fishing? Or um, how, where do you think this is going? Or how do you see this? Um. I noticed that you, in your alternative gear section, you do not put active gears in. So I guess you have done some uh, thoughts about this. Uh, yeah, I have. Um, well, many of these fish, most of these fishermen, I mean, you saw, uh, you, you, you saw the, 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 the bar plot at some point in the presentation, they use uh, small vessels and they like that. They like to be on small vessels. Uh, that's what at least they tend to say. They like to be on board on their own, and and it's relatively easy to 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 set a net and to hold a net. So I would say that for the ones I've met, at the very least, they're not really really willing to switch to uh, active gears. It doesn't mean that they're willing, but they're, they're not necessarily willing to. Uh, pots can be an option in, in for for some of them, and it is. We have, we actually have started some 
some things about this. Um, and more generally, is bycatch, because I think that's your question, right? Is bycatch of protected species kind of dragging uh, the gillnet fisheries to, towards disappearing somehow? It might participate, but I really don't think that's necessarily the, 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 the most uh, predominant thing here. Like bycatch has become, I mean, bycatch of seabirds at, at the very least has been studied for many years, but it's really become preeminent for the last, what, maybe 15 years or so, maybe a bit more. Uh, and, and we can see that there's been a decrease in the number of uh, gillnet vessels in, in Denmark, for, for instance, since the 90s or the mid 90s. And you know, quite a drastic uh, uh, change of behavior. And I'm not sure that that has anything to do with the bycatch of protected species. It might have been, yeah, other things that I'm not aware of. Now, I think that at least in Denmark, I know in some of the places it, it, it's different, but at least in Denmark, there's a, a, almost a, um, I don't know how to say that, but, they, but uh, people like their small fish, fishermen. There are people who want to go, like me, for instance, who want to go on the harbor and buy fish for, for, from local fishermen and not necessarily in a supermarket, uh, fish uh, caught by a troll. Uh, um, not, not that it's bad that it's caught by a troll, it's not what I mean, but, uh, but, but that's a reality. And so I think there is a future for, 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 for these fisheries. And besides, yes, I mean, they are uh, better in terms of... Uh, fuel consumption and people are getting more and more aware of this. So of course we might switch to electric uh, engines in the future. Uh, yes, I'm not, uh, I mean, it's, yeah, it has a lot of implications. So I'm, I, to, to answer more clearly, I don't think that bycatch is the, the, the main uh, driver of uh, the decreasing number of, uh, of fishing vessels in Danish water. Oh, but I guess there will definitely be a uh, discussion how much can we accept at some stage. Uh, into yeah, well, that, 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 that goes to the threshold and how do we define uh, what is acceptable or not. And again, it's case uh, dependent, it's species dependent, it's even uh, population dependent for some species. Uh, and to look into it, we need to you know, gather data, uh, both from the fisheries, but also from uh, the seabird experts. Uh, I think uh, I mentioned that before that population viability analysis are quite a nice tool uh, because it's, I mean, it tools in it's, it, because there's not one type of uh, of, of these analysis. Uh, yeah, to to look into the future uh, and to and and to predict the uh, yeah or to forecast the what the what the population will uh, become in if one scenario is being chosen like we keep fishing as we do, or if we switch to another gear and we reduce the bycatch rates of some species and so on. Um, thank you. I, I think I'll stop, uh, stop you here, Tilda, and thank you uh, on behalf of the committee. Thank you very much for a presentation and the last uh, two hours of uh, very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, then we will simply uh, see you a little bit later. Okay. Well, I'm the one thanking you, so I'll... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have a bit of water because I can feel my voice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wow. That is uh, rather seldomly happening that we uh, use the full time for defenses. But uh, just allow me that remark. I think it was a really good discussion. Even for a guy like me working with uh, fish interactions. I mean, you came on these issues of spatial heterogeneity, the oddities of sampling, and uh, the application of the knowledge hotspots over dispersion. Uh, really, really good. Thank you, Gilda, and uh, thank you to all of you for this really interesting afternoon. What I am trying to do now is I created a breakout room for you, Dominic, uh, Ludwig, and Simon, and uh, I will transfer you there in a minute. Uh, you can leave the room yourself it is on the lower menu bar that uh, shows up in Zoom when you move your mouse, there you can choose leave. And uh, I would then like to ask you to uh, formulate your recommendation to the PhD committee. And uh, when you have done that, uh, please come back and uh, tell us, and uh, especially Gilders, what, uh, what you came up with. So uh, I will open the room now and I hope to see you soon again.
Good to see you are still here, Jonas. <laughs> yes, we had a long and tiring discussion uh, around all the um, good uh, discussion we had this afternoon. Um, collecting scientific data on uh, accidental catches of birds with low numbers, that is difficult. It's a controversial subject also. Uh, as the fishermen uh, know that such bycats can challenge their fisheries in the future. And um, collecting such data on board vessels with camera is also difficult, uh, as the fishermen don't really like uh, that system. Uh, and also, what you aim of when you want to do science, you want strong data. And that's hard to collect in this line of business uh, that you have chosen here, bycats of birds. So I, I don't really know what you have done to Finn and Lotte uh, since they gave you this PhD project. That was not straightforward. But uh, I think you did very, very well here. Your synopsis is very written. It's a comprehensive and detailed. There's a clear and coherent scope of the three papers. The papers describe a number of technological innovations aiming to explore, understand, and mitigate bycats of birds in Danish gillnet fisheries. The significant advancement made in this thesis is the increased understanding of spatiotemporal patterns in seabird bycatches in the Danish small scale gillnet fisheries. Uh, derived by uh, innovative data collection and analysis. That was impressive. Uh, Thank you. The thesis provides new scientific knowledge, methods, and conclusions that can be used to assess and to reduce bycatch of birds in small scale gillnet fisheries. The impact of the research is likely to be for scientists in the field to consider sources of data, analysis, and modeling data, quantifying seabirds bycatch in a final scale using electronic monitoring and uh, AIS data. Today you have presented your work in a clear and well-structured presentation first, and then we had two full hours uh, with questions, quite broad questions that uh, where you need to say, well, it's not small details questions, it's broad questions that where you need to, of course, uh, be able to defend what you have done in your work, but you also need to master the research field in a broader sense, and you did well there. So that means, Gildas, you give us little choice here. <laughs> uh, it's therefore with great pleasure that Simon, Dominic, and I recommend that you'll be given the title Philosophia Doctor or PhD for your thesis and your defense today and send that recommendation to the PhD school. So congratulations. Well done. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm sort of happy here, I must say. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for the nice talk. I mean, it's very interesting. I, I really, really like to have your input. I would definitely like uh, all of you to be here right now because that would be good to continue talking about this and other things. Um, I was to say, you know, next time, but uh, I'm not sure I'm going to start another PhD just right away. But uh, yeah, I, I really hope that uh, we get to, to talk about these things face to face. Uh, yeah, in the future, so thank you. Uh, thank you also from me, uh, especially to Dominic and Simon to uh, volunteer as uh, sensors and to uh, Ludby. Um, I'm going to close this meeting now uh, and wish all of you a very, very nice day. That's all I can say after this long day. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Thank all you. Thank you for a nice afternoon and congratulations again. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.